Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Sorry for all the uh, technical difficulties. There's always a saying that we were going to solve AI before we solve video conferencing. And that continues to be true in every time uh, we do one of these things. Um, anyway, um, lovely to meet you all. Um, I think you can hear me now. So um, let me talk a little bit about the state of AI. And I'm obviously going to focus a lot on language models. Uh, let's dive let's uh, right in. So first of all, why is it a big deal, right? So we've been working in AI for a long time. Um, the field has been around for you know almost a, you know 50, 70 years. Um, and a lot of the progress these days has obviously been built on research and fantastic progress that people have made over the years. But it still is a very big moment, I, I think, right now for a few reasons, right? Which is historically, AI has been built in very bespoke ways. We always used to take one task and build AI models to solve a very specific problem, you know, whether it's recognizing uh, objects and images or whether it is doing you know, um, language understanding for a very specific task like sentiment prediction, for example. right? But the current wave of AI is really much more general. Um, the models are have very widespread use. They can do lots of different things. And they are able to adapt to new contexts and to new problems much more easily than ever before. So we have this idea of what we sometimes saw, uh, talk about as zero shot or in-context learning, where the model, even when it hasn't entirely seen some uh, the same problem before, it is able to reason on the fly. Uh, it is able to generate things, not just do predictive things, right? And uh, that's been really interesting. You know, We can generate images. We can uh, generate fluent essays. And it's able to reason things. For the first time, we're seeing where uh, AI is able to think through problems. Maybe it's preliminary. It's not quite as advanced as uh, what we would all hope for. But you see the signs of it able, able to reason through things, which is really amazing. And all of this has also led to a completely new paradigm in how we approach the interface to computing. Right? We are now able to converse with these systems in much more natural ways, like you would talk to other people. And that really is, changes the way people interact with, with computing and with software and with products in general. The last thing I'll touch upon a little bit is this uh, notion of scaling loss. I will actually pause there for a second. I will talk about it in a, in a slide in a few in a few slides. So here's a, a pay, the performance of GPT-4 on a variety of benchmarks. And what you can see is first uh, how much better it is on various benchmarks compared to the previous model. But also, many of these benchmarks are things like um, exams that people take, right? And you can see that these models are now performing close enough to humans in many, many, many tasks, right? And that has really led to an incredible amount of progress in what we are using these models for. And the fact that now they are operating close to a human level is actually been a, a fantastic progress for the field. I talked about scaling laws earlier, so this is what I mean. What, what we are seeing is that as we train larger and larger models, the performance of these models tend to getting better, and we don't necessarily know if there is an end in sight. So there's a sense of anticipation that the next big model is going to unlock completely new capabilities, and sometimes we call these as emergent properties. So for example, when you looked at GPT 3.5 compared to GPT 4, GPT 4 was a pretty big step up in terms of capabilities. And it was also a much larger model, obviously. right? But it unlocked completely new things, like, for example, in terms of being able to reason through standardized tests. It does much better than 3.5. right? And not that's not something we necessarily expected. Now there is a sense of anticipation for when the next big model comes, what new capabilities is it going to have? And you know, what more things can we are we going to be able to automate and use uh, do using AI? And that sense of anticipation is actually also one of the reasons why I think um, we're in this very exciting time. Uh, just to give you a very quick overview of how these systems work, um, you know, we these models are trained on a large amount of unlabeled text data, uh, usually public data that we have pulled from the internet, Wikipedia, and things of that nature. And there is a phase that we call pre-training, where we train these models basically to just predict the next word in a sentence, right? Or uh, we call it the next token. And that's the first phase of the training. And this phase of training takes a fair amount of compute, and it takes a long time. Uh, and it's done on a lot of unlabeled data. 
And then we do a second phase, which we call fine tuning, which is done on a much smaller amount of label data. And here, the goal of the, mod of the training is to really get the language model to be able to be more aligned with what we want from this as humans, right? So we also call this the alignment step, where we are training the model to basically behave in ways that we would like them to behave in response to certain questions. So think of the first phase as building more general knowledge of the world, and the second phase is sort of like guiding the model to behaviors that we would like. Now, why does this work at all, right? It's kind of insane to think that just by learning to, uh, just by training to predict the next word in a sentence or the next token, that these models are behaving these really, really interesting ways. Now, the, the scientific answer is that we don't entirely know this yet, right? I think this is still a research field, explainability and how these model work, uh, models work is still something we're, we're trying to understand. But at a very intuitive level, what is happening is this, right? By, if you want to really, really do be good at prediction, you have to have some understanding of the underlying data and the underlying mechanics, right? So if I pose you a problem and say, tell me what I'm going to say, blah, right? You're going to have to have a reasonable understanding of me, of the world, and like the, the distribution of words in a language in order to make a very reasonable estimate of what kinds of words I might say next, right? And you're, you're built all of that over time. We as humans have built all of that over time by just you know growing up, by interacting with other people, by interacting with the world. And we've had some ways in which our brains and our genetics have worked to help us build that. I think at some intuitive level, something, um, I wouldn't say necessarily similar, but some compression and some learning is happening in these AI models where by learning to predict, they are forming some representation of the underlying data and they are learning to reason through things to be able to react better to new contexts and to new uh, situations, which is one of the most exciting things that's happening, which is the fact that they can sort of innately build some sort of reasoning capability to be able to react to new situations is pretty amazing. So that's in a nutshell sort of like a sense of why it's exciting, uh, how these language models are trained and why they behave, I think, the way they behave. Uh, although we don't deeply understand it, I think we're still a lot of doing a lot of research. So I'll shift gears a little bit to tell you a little about products that we are building using these uh, language models, right? And at, uh, us at OpenAI, we fundamentally have two main products. One is ChatGPT, which is a consumer product that you can go to and interact with it in a conversational way. And then we also have developer APIs that we have enabled for lots of developers all over the world to build interesting applications on their own. So just to give you a very quick sense, ChatGPT, uh, we have about 100 million weekly active users. And that's pretty interesting for a product that is just barely a year old, right? We, we launched ChatGPT just close to a, a year ago. And uh, when we launched, honestly, OpenAI didn't really expect this to take off this well. Like we thought it would be a research preview. Maybe people will pay, play with this. We weren't really prepared for the, the volume of uh, users and the types of things that people have been uh, using this for. And we're obviously very excited and also humbled by that. Uh, and the use cases include people are using it as writing assistants. Uh, lots of people use it for coding. It's fantastic for that, for data analysis. Lots of really research and knowledge work. You want to analyze something. Uh, it's really good as a creative and an, uh, an assistive tool. It's obviously really good at summarization as well. So you can feed it long documents. It will summarize things for you. And lots and lots of other use cases. You know, people ask it to, you know, generate jokes. You know, people ask it to generate poems, and it's just like there's just just amazing amount of use cases here. Um, that's broadly ChatGPT. I will also talk about our some of our newer stuff that we have built around how you can customize ChatGPT for very specific purposes. Um, but just to give you a sense of the impact uh, it's having on various things that people are doing, this is a study that I'm. I have here, and where people analyzed what is the impact on productivity for people, right? And here people are using this as a writing assistant to complete their task. And it uh, the people who use this basically took 40% less time to complete their task, and the quality of their output was 18% better, right? And this was such study was done a few months ago. And this is just one example of how much impact you know these tools are having. And there's also been a lot more studies to say that, you know, it's actually having more impact on people who might be less skilled. Um, and, you know, that's actually a really positive thing in some ways because, you know, this tool can now be a, a great equalizer for people too, right? People who have varying degrees of skills can 
actually use AI as an assistive tool to be able to do our jobs better. Um, so let me talk a little bit about our developer platform. So that was ChatGPT uh, at a very high level. So our developer platform, essentially we provide APIs for developers to build really interesting applications. We've had an amazing amount of interest from the developer community. Over 2 million developers are building on top of our platform, including many, many Fortune 500 companies. Um, we have a basic chat completions API, which is uh, you know, basically how you would interact on ChatGPT, but you can have that in an API form where you send the human input and we would produce the machine output. Uh, there's also a more sophisticated assistance API, which we will talk about in a second. Uh, and now we also have the ability for if you have custom data sets that you might have unique assets in your own business or your company and you want our AI to be able to understand that better, you can bring that and you can fine tune our models to be able to work better for your own use cases. Um, I'll, I'll start talking a little bit about what how these models are are, are um, being used beyond just in the, the text domain, right? Text is obviously important. I think it's a great conversational tool, but there's life is more than just text, right? So um, there's lots of really interesting stuff we have done with visual input and visual output, audio input and audio output. And um, People are also outside of OpenAI are also trying these in other domains, right? You people want to use this for generating 3D assets, for example. You can imagine that people who build games would be really interested in that. Uh, 3D asset creation is a very powerful thing. You can apply this in the field of biology to understand protein structures, uh, and people are using similar techniques to do that. Um, so there's just a wide variety of uses of language models and the techniques behind language models in a variety of domains. Uh, I would just want to give you a few examples of some of these multimodal things that we have. This is an example of uh, DALI 3, uh, which is generate, which is our image generation tool. And uh, Coca-Cola used this to create a Diwali campaign, right? And this is the output that uh, you know they've done for this campaign. And it's pretty amazing, right? Just to be able to have something really interesting like that. Uh, and I've used this for you know many things. I I created prompts that says, you know, I want to have and a uh, visual of Diwali being celebrated in San Francisco, where I live, and it created this beautiful picture of the Golden Gate Bridge uh, with Diwali lights on it, right? It'd be very hard for me to get things like that off the shelf, right? And so it's, a, it's been a really amazing tool for my own personal use as well. Um, another thing we have done is what we call GPT-4 with vision. So you can now uh, upload images, whether it's in our API or in chat GPT, and you can really have a conversation about images, right? So. Here is an example that you see that it's generating a pretty detailed description of what it's seeing, right? This is, uh, you know, it's pasta and it's giving you a detailed description of what the pasta is about. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty cool actually. And people are using this again for really lots of interesting use cases. Uh, next is speech. I'm gonna play a sound clip here, uh, which shows you that um, people are having very natural conversations with these systems. And one of the most amazing things is just the, the quality of the the speech that is generated is very natural sounding and it's almost like talking to a person right and combined with the fact that our models can actually also understand to some extent what you are having and have reasonable outputs we've sort of really unlocked this interesting new use case of just like talking to the system um and i've had a friend who told me that you know just switched on chat gpt in voice mode while he was driving for an hour and he just had a conversation with it for an hour and it was amazing, right? So uh, lots of really new things in, in use cases that are emerging. Let me play uh, this audio and it's actually really interesting to see the humor in this, the the voice in this, and uh, let me let me hear, I'll play this for you. Hey, could you tell me the story of the three little pigs in the character of a total frat bro? Absolutely, bro. Here we go. All right, so there's these three little pig bros, right? Living it up, enjoying the college life. First up, we've got Davey. Dude's all about taking the easy route. He thinks, why put in the effort? And just slaps together a crib out of straw. Honestly, kind of feels like those dudes who wear the same party shirt every weekend. You know the type. Then there's Mikey, the middle bro. A bit more into appearances, wants to one-up Davey a bit. So he goes and builds his pad out of sticks. Kind of like when you upgrade to those fancy beer pong cups instead of the cheap ones. Looks cooler, but is it sturdy? Not so much. Now, the third pig, Ricky, 
This dude's next level, probably the frat president or something. He ain't messing around. Builds his spot out of bricks, man. Solid is that bro who never misses leg day. Okay, I'm going to pause there. So anyway, you got the idea. I think it's just a really interesting example of taking a very classic you know, story and trying to do a very new riff on it. Uh, and it's all completely automated and you just gave it a prompt and out comes this amazing, like funny audio, which is very human sounding, right? Um, and so you can imagine this now being used in lots of different ways. You can use this as a storytelling tool. Uh, you can create new stories on the fly with very little work. And I think it's going to uh, inspire a lot of creators to do amazing things. Um, so I talked about, you know, uh, ChatGPT. I talked about our APIs. I talked about some of the multimodal stuff that's happening. One of the other things that you're going to see these AI systems behave is um, we're now taking it out in the real world. And we want our AI systems to not just know about the data they were trained on, which is largely public internet data, but now they are starting to learn to operate in the real world with tasks and problems that people care about. So from the, some of the ways in which you're doing this is you can customize your G, uh, chat GPT or our API to create what we call GPTs or assistants, and you can create custom, uh, you can give it custom instructions. You can ask it to learn completely new data. So you can upload a set of files and then say, I want you to understand what's in these files. That's the way it can learn external knowledge beyond what it was trained on. And you can also teach it to learn to call functions, which is actually a very amazing capability, uh, which is to learn to get these AI models to learn to take actions in the real world. right? Um, and it, it knows how to use tools like browsing. It can actually write code and execute code in a contained environment. It can generate images. And like I said, it can learn to call new functions on the fly. And essentially what you should expect is that the intelligence of these systems are going to continue to increase over time. And what that means is that these AI systems are now are going to be able to do increasingly more complex tasks over time, right? Um, you saw on the tip of some of these examples, like you know, you saw how you can generate ad campaigns, you know, you saw how you can generate stories. Let me show you one more example of this in action. Um, this is Canva, which is a, a tool that people use for generating you know, nice posters and presentations and other visual assets. And here, what we have, we are seeing is, um, we just asked this to generate a poster for the OpenAI's dev day. We had a reception in the evening. And all we said is like, hey, I want to just generate a poster, right? And Canva has APIs to do all of this, right? So you know, there's an API to generate poster style stuff. But using ChatGPT, we were able to create the text for these posters. And using Canva's APIs, these GPTs now understood how to call Canva's APIs to generate these posters, right? And so that's the new thing that you're seeing, which is the AI is not just learning to generate text, but the AI is learning to invoke functions, right? Which is a, a, another new capability that is pretty exciting. And here it generated a couple of options. You can click through it, you know, you can finalize it and you can post it. So here's an example like, you know, of uh, something that now you can imagine that as it has learned to use new actions out in the world, lots of new emerging capabilities are going to be possible. Um, I'll give you another example, which is you can create a custom GPT to act as a tech advisor, right? So you know, maybe you have customer service manuals or product manuals. You can upload all of that, tell the GPT to say, you know, just use this to provide advice to people and people ask questions. It can actually pull the right segments from this and summarize the answers and give it back to them. So again, another cool examples of customizing GPTs for a very specific purpose. Okay, um, I'm gonna next talk a little bit about some of the challenges with uh, these AI models, right? So obviously they are great at lots of different things, but it's also challenging to build with them and you have to keep, uh, keep a cert certain things in mind. So there's a bunch of challenges. Maybe one I will a higher level thing about caveat is that fundamentally AI systems are very different to build with. You know, they're they're non-deterministic in a way, right? They're not very conventional software systems that we are used to before, where you know you give an input, you expect a very clear output, which is very consistent and deterministic. Uh, that's what we're used to for a very long time. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view. AI systems are not quite that, right? Like, you know, they are, they are, they behave in interesting ways. They behave in different ways, depending on what you give it. And 
in some ways it's like interacting with another person you're not quite sure what you're going to get back right and that is both interesting but it's also challenging beyond the non determinism there's also a whole variety of safety challenges you know these ai systems can obviously be abused in a lots of different ways they can generate misinformation they can generate other types of un uh, harmful or unwanted content you have to think about fairness and bias in these models uh, they are of course not perfect they hallucinate they make up stuff they sometimes the reasoning is not correct and so you have to be careful um and you can also they can be jailbroken in some ways um okay i'm sorry i think i'm just seeing a message from swadi we have another 5 minutes yeah i'll i'll wrap up in 2 minutes or a minute and then we'll have a, a, minute, a few minutes for questions and there's also really important uh, questions around what economic impact is ai having on the world uh and there's an entire new field around thinking about catastrophic risk with ai can ai systems persuade people in ways that we don't want them to right as we start interacting with ai more and more are there other sorts of unwanted risk like whether can people use this in ways to generate biological weapons or can the and there be existential risk with ai and these are questions i would say we need to take seriously and we need to understand um but it's it's the as these models get progressively better these are things that we have to be very thoughtful about and uh, there's a lot of work to be done in understanding the, the impact of these systems um and of course there's also plenty of opportunity so this is going to be my last slide i'll probably end with this and what can you do with ai on the positive side right so there's lots of stuff you can do i think one common pattern is to think of them as assistants or copilots for any favorite domain i've seen this in legal in um in finance in uh in coding in writing and all of that right and you can really use this to improve productivity of knowledge work across a whole number of domains um some general suggestions you have think about any unique data assets you have and you can build ip around it and build models around it by fine tuning um think about a completely new natural interfaces to how you can build products in the future every time there is a new uh, human compute interface paradigm it always creates new opportunities for people and i think this is going to be another big one and i don't think conversation is the only interface here by the way i think as these ai systems get more sophisticated i think we're going to be have more interesting maybe more asynchronous interfaces with these systems as well and these systems like i said are going to get increasingly intelligent with higher reasoning capabilities over time and generally my suggestion is just build and iterate um and try it out i think it's an amazing time to build this is the biggest technological revolution i think we're all going to see in our lives and it's going to have an incredible impact on all of us um i'm not going to do too much here you can use our developer apis if you're interested there's lots of stuff you can build and we also have a no code way to do this this is the gpt's product that we launched so you don't have to code you can just go to the ui and build you know interesting gpt's for people to try out so i will stop there and we'll take a few questions and i can't hear the room so hopefully i will be able to so hello yeah i can hear now hello uh, uh thank you for the insightful session uh yeah hope i am audible yeah okay uh, so incidentally uh, so i am a co-founder of a tech startup bluebot tech labs and we have built a development platform uh, which is powered or assisted by gpt4 uh, allowing creation of custom applications through natural conversations and uh, one of the questions we have is uh, so we had a two year journey where we built the platform in a service led man manner we had teams which were deploying custom applications through the development platform once the gpt4 got integrated all, all the employees in my office itself asked that uh, everything is now automated so people really don't we don't need to use them anymore uh, so and it's good for uh, all of them as they are young so we are able to migrate them to product development aspect but for people who are already veterans in the industry 
is there something which this cannot do and uh, at least for the next 20 years uh, 20 years is too long time but for the next 10 years is there something which humans can do which this ai cannot do in the uh, software development space i think the honest answer is 10 years is still pretty far out uh, for me to make any meaningful uh, prediction about it because if you asked me 10 years ago like would i have imagined this moment absolutely not right it was very hard for any of us to imagine this and so i think the reality is that we are in a in a moment where the pace of technological progress is really high and i talked about scaling laws i talked about emergent properties i think we're on a trajectory where these systems are going to get more powerful they will have better reasoning capabilities and it's very hard to say what they're not going to be what human things are not going to be able to do i think you should assume that they're going to get better at reasoning you should assume that they're going to get smarter in lots of different dimensions. Now, there is a big question on what does that do to people? Like, what are the jobs of the future? I honestly don't know the answer. I think we will figure it out. I think this will be like other major big technological revolutions of previous times, right? Whether it's the industrial revolution, whether it's electricity. Um, I think this is so massive and so broad that this will have very big impact in the economy. But every time big, big revolutions have happened, we as humans have also kind of figured out what are the new jobs of the future, right? And ultimately, you know, we as humans value other humans and want to see other humans uh, do things that we uh, that you know we're willing to pay for. So, for example, you know, we have uh, AI that is better at humans than better than humans at playing chess, right? But we still want to watch people playing chess, right? And we we want to see that, right? And we're willing to reward that as a society. Similarly, you know, there's cars that move from point a to point b faster than any human would right but there's still you know we watch people watch uh, like usain bolt or other runners do that right so there's always i think we as humans have a need for creating economies around other people and i think that will continue to be true in the future as well and my prediction and hope is that ai will become assistive to all of us it will create these amazing superpowers that will amplify all of our individual capabilities and we will still have an amazing economy centered around humans and one follow-up question, uh, OpenAI fund uh, application, how do we go about that? Um, you should apply, but if you're, you're also welcome to email me and I can forward it to them. Uh, I don't run that fund, but I'm happy to you know send things their way. Uh, uh, well, as we know how useful ChatGPT is, do you believe is it making its user lazy? Um, I mean, look, today's AI, you cannot replace anyone, right? So you have to review the output. Uh, it can make mistakes. It can hallucinate. It can do all these things. So I really look at it as an assistive tool. And you, of course, I would love for, for, to, for people to use it to make your job simpler but it doesn't replace your job and it doesn't, you have to review what it does. So my belief is that it will make you faster. It will not make you, it shouldn't make you lazier. Hi, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. So what is the new hype about QSTAR and can you tell me, you know, like uh, something about it, you know, like, uh, uh, unfortunately, not much. And, and for the other thing I would say is don't believe everything you read in the press. So, uh, quick uh, comment on uh, the intersection of artificial intelligence and uh, renewable energy, batteries, solar, any sort of thoughts on that intersection of these two fields? Yeah. I'm not an expert in energy or batteries, but what I can tell you is that... Um, I think AI will have a lot of impact in every field, including science. And I know people are using this for maybe new material design, new like creating things with new properties. And uh, there's a fantastic amount of research happening in that field, which is how can you use AI? Because if you can understand chemistry, you can sort of maybe use this to guide the design of new molecules. You can use that to create you know, new polymers or new other synthetic materials. And all of that, I think, can be uh, used for, you know, one, uh, to create better things around energy. 
Um, but you know, I'm not a deep domain expert in that field. But what I will tell you is that basically, uh, I think every knowledge work field, you can think of this as assisting your work and helping you do your job in interesting new ways. Can you hear? Can you hear? Me? Yeah. So we're working on a skill-free video creation, uh, essentially an end-to-end -end video production for brands. And we're uh, excited to understand where do we stand with regard to video recognition. The whole temporal, the extent of temporal understanding that it has, and the kind of pipeline uh, uh, in the pipeline, you know, it is it is placed for you. You're talking about uh, understanding videos in general, right? Not video generation. Uh, no, understanding the videos. Understanding? Yeah, it's not something we explicitly like work on. Um, you know, our uh, open AI, our mission fundamentally is sort of building very broad general purpose AI systems that can think and that can reason. Um, the, the earliest example you can see is the GPT with vision, right? So now you can attach an image and you will be able to have, you can have a dialogue with it uh, around images. I expect in the future that as these models get better, like you should be able to upload a video and you should be able to talk about it as well. Uh, but you know, we're not there today, and it's hard for me to predict exactly when and how that will happen. Okay, uh, Srinivas, this is Swadeep here. This is the last question. Sounds and good. Uh, all fantastic. Yeah, just uh, one minute, please. Yeah, hi, Srinivas. Thank you for taking our time on this. So, Srinivas, I work on healthcare AI products, and uh, one of the critical part we are facing challenges in that. How do you find the interpretability of these uh, LLMs or all these models? And how, like, you know, building up a responsible AI, you know, because doctors doesn't know how exactly these decisions are being made. So what OpenAI is doing to navigate that? Too? Yeah, like, this is a pretty deep and broad uh, field. And so it will probably be a more nuanced discussion that we need to have. It will be very hard to answer in 30 seconds because definitions of responsible AI really depend on the context and what you're really trying to do. Um, in the context of health, it depends on what explainability means to you. Right? So um, the models are, in some ways, you give it an input and they're going to give you an output. And if you ask why it gives an output, it might be able to give you a reason for that. Like Especially uh, models like ChatGPT can say, you know, here's maybe a reason. The best advice I would have is first define what you mean by responsibility and ethics. Like what is it exactly that would satisfy you? The second thing I would have is use this as an assistive tool. Like I've seen this, like, you know, these uh, systems being used by doctors as an assistive tool. Like it can, it can really be an idea generation tool. It can generate you or lead you to avenues that you might not have thought about before, right? And then, but there's still a human making the final decision at the end and using the AI as actually an input, right? I think that's a very powerful paradigm, right? Think of it more as a co-pilot as instead of like a complete replacement. Great. Awesome. Shrinivas, thank you so much. What a wonderful talk. Thank you. Guys, give him a big round of applause. We have a full house here. Shrinivas, we have a full house. Like few um, hundred people. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, sorry, I couldn't be there in person in Bangalore, but uh, thanks, thank you well. all. And uh, yeah, we're gonna Absolutely. have you next time. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye. Give a big, big round of applause. Thank you. Okay, so so everybody excited? What a fantastic, fantastic guys! Who the man behind ChatGPT himself, man? Hundred million people using. Now we have uh, the next is going to be a VC demo day. I would request all the investors. Uh, people who are wearing green tags, we have very, very smartly used green for the right reason, obviously. Uh, and uh, there are multiple investors in this room, dozens of them actually. So I would request all the investors, please come up. Don't feel shy. Come over here and please start committing checks right away. <laughs> right? But all jokes apart, to be honest, we have had dozens and dozens of applications, 150 plus. We are, uh, Hundreds actually we screen. Then we looked at 150. Then we whittled them down to the top. We have the top eight startups right now, which is a VC demo day that's happening. To 10 million and above, right? We have VCs who are writing checks from anywhere from a couple of million to even up to 5, 10 million. We have multiple people in the room and we're going to start the VC demo day right now. I hope the first startup is already ready. And I'm going to give the mic to the MC. Who's who's uh, controlling the? You're controlling it. Yeah. Over to you.
first three rows if you can keep for investors they're requesting the if you can have the investors please bring the investors up here all the investors with the green tags pulkit ji please come here i can see vesh kartik kartik please come up front i know a lot of you folks are hiding at the back please take the first two three rows if you can there you go thank you kartik we have where is arjun rao please take the first few seats uh, why don't you announce come please so i have mr uh, please i have mr vardarajan who is uh, iit madras 1967 batch 1966 batch give him a round of applause uh, he just wants to make a very small announcement about iit and iit uh, acb please i don't know how many of you have heard of iit alumni center bengaluru an association started by professor ashok mishra retired professor of iit bombay it is being built it has already been built at uh, bomma sandra industrial complex so especially the focus here is to build about 5000 crores of industry because iits alumni and the industry work together so it's open on sunday all of you who are available come and visit me at 11 o'clock on sunday iit alumni center bengaluru and we have several stalwarts and parfi is going to be part of that area thank you Okay, guys. Uh, we are getting ready for the pitches. I still see one or two empty seats. All the investors, I'm requesting. Otherwise, I have to hand pick you guys out of the crowd. Please come up front. All the investors. Uh, I can see Nihar. What are you doing? Yeah, Raja, come on. Nihar, Pankaj, Pankaj, Raina. Please come up front. I have started picking up names. Otherwise, all the investors. Manu, where is Manu? Manu, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Please. Manu, I am Blue Hill Capital. Zephyr Peak is here. We have XVD Ventures. Okay, great. Take the first. Inflexor is here. Anush, can come. Anush, yeah, tomorrow. Oh, great. Come on, choose here. Any other investors I'm missing? Any green tags? Sanjay ji, abhi bade ho. Please, all the investors, please take the first few rows. We're going to start the demo day. Please take the first few rows. Sanjay ji, please. Take the first few rows. Good. Okay, looks like we have more than 50, 60 investors here. I'm excited, guys. We're going to start the demo day. Who's the first? Uh, who's the first startup? Stempedia. Stempedia. Pankaj, show me the list of. Online, okay. Print out, me. Print out. Where is it? Have we given print out to all the startup, uh, all the investors? Uh huh. What else? Have we given? Mine. Give us it. So, what will you do? Shitej, where are the printouts? Shitej, where are the printouts? I need the printouts right away. Thirty seconds. Karthik, investor man, go sit up front. Uh, you got the wrong tag. Go sit in front. Okay, so we made some sheets. I'm going to explain to you what it is. We have uh, there's a seat there, Sandeep. There's a seat. So I'm going to explain to you. We're going to have uh, eight startups. They're going to pitch. Okay, they're going to have ten minutes each. So that's eighty minutes. We'll try to wrap it up a little faster. After that is lunch. So it's going to they're the only ones between us and lunch. So we're going to rush them a little bit. Um, sorry, there's a little bit delay going on.
Okay, can you guys hear me? Better? Okay, we're back. So we have had dozens of uh, hundreds of uh, startup pitches. We have screened every single one of them. Every single one of the startup has been screened by five or more jury members. And these jury members are not just angel investors. Many of them are actually VC analysts, associates, and above who have looked at them. Right from Stellaris to Nexus, Inflexor, Pavestone, all these are large 500,000, 2,000 crore funds. Okay, so they have been screened by all of these folks. We're going to give you a sheet. And as you can see, we're distributing them. Please give pens also to them. Along with them. I don't think they'll have pens. Yeah, you're going to get a pen or a pencil along with you. Please mark. We're going to have eight names with one line about each of them. Please mark if you want to meet them or not. That's it. Simple. Check if you want to meet. If you don't, just leave it blank or you can cross it out. Right? We're going to collect it. Please write your names. I'm going to give one minute uh, for you to write your names on top. Names, phone number, and email ID. And also where you're from. We're going to go ahead. Is everybody have uh, a sheet? All the investors have a sheet? He needs a pen over here, please. Give him a pen or a pencil quickly. Some more pens and pencils. Sorry, Pankaj. We're going to start in 30 seconds. I hope everybody has got, all the investors have got a sheet. I need the investors to have a sheet for sure. Are this... Investors, please come from front. If you don't come front, you won't get the sheet. So please, please come front. We have space in the front. We have some seats in the front. Yeah, we do have three, four seats. Please come up. Anybody with a green tag, I'm going to pick on you. Please, please. Oh, there's so many investors at the back. Guys, come on. Please come up front. Aja, up for Aja. Yeah, come on. Okay, great. We're going to get started right now with the first pitch. Um, Kathy, please make sure they get the sheets and the notebooks or at least a pen. Kathy, these guys also, these gentlemen. Give them the sheets, please. And pen also. Do they need pen? Give them pens. Pens, pens. Mayank, pens. Whoever is getting a... Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, we're going to start with the pitch. The first... Uh, give me the sheet of the first uh, startup is going to be. Is it in order? Aguilo, yeah, Aguilo Research Tempedia, revolutionizing the way K-12 st students learn about 21st century skills, AI, AR, VR, robotics, and computer education. I've always been looking for co quality coaches to coach my own kid, right? So let's uh, hear it from Pankaj. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Pankaj Kumar Verma. I am. Uh, uh, 2017 IT Kanpur pass out. Uh, so I and Drupal started this company, Stempedia, and uh, we are catering to like how the students of age 5 to 16 can learn about coding and robotics in a very fun way. Uh, and for that, we have created a whole ecosystem uh, doing uh, that. So um, we are supported by Artpark. Uh, we have uh, uh, been associated with them for the last two years, have been supporting us uh, for the growth part as well. So I would start off with the uh, problem part. So as all we know, uh, AI and robotics are, these are the fields that are going to have a very uh, uh, big economic boost in the coming times. So uh, like our idea is basically we have to uh, like make our kids ready for the future. So it, it's not like they have to master it all uh, in, in the first go. But what, the, what we want is to basically get them experience to the world of coding and robotics how they can experience it so that uh, they are able to develop uh, interpersonal uh, skills, co cognitive skills, computational thinking, problem solving, all those parts. So that's the major goal that we have, that we want to give them exposure and uh, like for, go from rote learning to a more hands-on learning uh, part. So as, as a problem, if we see uh, when, when the student want to learn about robotics or AI, the entry barrier is very high right now. Uh, the students uh, uh, don't have platforms at age five, six to uh, like take any uh, coding platform. They cannot learn Python. So what we have done, so, so, so that's the first problem that we are solving.
the other problems that we have is the accessibility part so if we want to go to masses uh, then we have to solve the problem that uh, laptop cannot be the sole device where the coding can be done it can it should be also available on the mobile devices so so that's the second problem that we are also taking and then uh, the third problem that we are taking is that uh, we have to uh, like uh, scale it up so that's why how we uh, like go into the market so whether we take the b2c b2b how wh what's the approach so 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 that is uh, something which we have taken uh, as as the problem uh, so as the as the solution what we have is we have created a full fledged ecosystem which have educational kits uh, these are the robotics kit that this Benefit with a vehicle like this. So, uh, where's India today? Uh, we have a large white space between, as I said, between the premium electric two uh, two wheelers and the entry level electric cars. But India today, uh, over the last decade, people's incomes have tripled, and that makes for ability to buy a second or a third car. And that's the target we are initially starting with. Uh, I already mentioned we are trying to fill that gap in the in the market and the and the vehicle will be priced at about five to seven lakhs there's a very large global market that we can address um, we are forecasting about uh, 450 million dollars of eva sales that we can achieve uh, in a very short time 
we took the car to the delhi auto expo we were overwhelmed with interest people crowded the booth we have over 8000 uh, signups on a on a pre order list we have uh, over 120 dealers saying mujhe gaadi chahiye mere uh, mere region mein uh, exclusively de jiye so we have tremendous uh, pull from the people who sell cars every day and that speaks for something uh, we had uh, we had huge uh, traction on uh, social media as well we have a clear moat uh, on terms of ip uh, smart category choice and our technical competence in house so i'll stop here we also have a fleet vehicle that we are building it's a uh, i'll show you what it is it's a b2b fleet uh, taxi which is a huge demand in india today with no other competing vehicle thank you yeah sorry i didn't get to that slide the ask is 10 million dollars uh 5 million will take us to all the detailed engineering to homologation and the next 5 million will take us to our first production run of a 100 cars uh, in consumer hands in uh, an 18 month timeline thank you we are open for one question otherwise you can catch me later outside right. what is the logic of the panel right the panel 500 kilowatt panel maybe 600 yeah. and 14 kilowatt hour battery how much is it really going to add to the range so it's a 150 watt panel on the roof much under than yeah that. so under indian sun conditions you get about 1 kilowatt hour uh, accumulation every day and that provides about 10 to 15 kilometers of driving range so that is what adds up to the 3000 kilometers per year so thank you so much um, if you want to catch me later you can also look me up on linkedin um, and on our website thanks Thank you so much. Uh, I don't want to stand between you and your lunch. The lunch is outside over here and please be back here in 30 minutes. The next session will start. Sorry to cut short the lunch.
Ventures. A warm welcome to you. Please have a seat. Um, Bloom Ventures manages 625 millions of assets. He also co-founded Head Start Network, India's largest startup community, which touches more than 100,000 entrepreneurs annually. This is fantastic. Happy to have you here. He was named in the prestigious 40 under 40 in 2020. Uh, one round of applause for him, guys. We'd like to welcome Ashish Kumar, who is the co-founder and general partner of Fundamentum, a Series B, B plus focused VC. It's one of its kind scale-up platform committed to help build enduring technology companies, starting off from 100 million fund, which is like 227 million in Australia recently. We're so happy to have you here. Welcome. Followed by Arjun Rao, who is GP at Specially Invest. He's a founding partner at Specially Invest, a seed VC fund, which is focused on deep science and tech startups in India, USA, Israel, and manages over 40 portfolio companies and $70 million in assets. It's great, great numbers. And looking forward to get all your perspectives. Warm welcome here. And followed by Vinay Bansan, who's a co-founder of Inflection Point Ventures. Uh, and Physical Capital Inflection Point Ventures, which is an early stage angel investing platform. It's having over 7,000 plus angel investors and investments in over 130 plus startups. 200 startups. So it's grown from the time I was given phone to now. So it's 200, 200 plus startups. Physics Capital is a $50 million VC fund by the co-founders of Inflection Point Ventures, one of the greatest, largest CXO driven angel investment firms in India. Happy to have you here. And uh, the last but not the least, <laughs> uh, the session is moderated by Vijayta Sastri, an associate director at Standard Chartered Bank. 28 years of handling challenging assignments in the <laughs> service industry, hospitality, travel, and co working. He's an avid startup member and mentor, many startups, business owners, and CXOs. Super excited. No, no more in between you guys. Over to you all. Fantastic. Thank you so much, ma'am. You did a phenomenal job in introducing each and every one of us. We discovered things about ourselves that we didn't know. So thank you for that. <laughs> okay. So ladies and gentlemen in the room, good afternoon. All good? We are doing good? Bangalore is treating you all well? Excellent. So for those are very quick questions now, if you don't mind, very quickly. Outside of Bangalore, startup founders. So we were debating this, right? Bangalore, Delhi, Bombay, Jambi. So there are people from outside of Bangalore, right? Arpit? Great. And then the next question is IIT alumni. I'm assuming 90%, but okay. Oh, my God. What a stupid question. <laughs> okay. Apart from these four wonderful gentlemen or investors, any other investors in the house? So many, right? So for those still looking for funding, apart from them four, you have many other people. Network with them later and don't leave the hall till we finish. After I do what you all want. So can I start, ma'am? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the introductions are done. So let's get into this immediately. So a round table conversation piece is what we want to do. We want to involve them as well. What, if you don't mind, just talk about the sectors and some of these phenomenal founders that you're working with and why you're working with them, crisp and short. And then, we, then what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, a few of you, we're going to ask you all to crowdsource some questions or rather some information that you want from these amazing resources. Does that make sense? Because we want you all involved, not a one-way conversation. Good enough? Perfect. So now over to you guys. Raja. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Arpet. Uh, I work with this firm called Bloom Ventures. Uh, we have been sector agnostic, but early stage focused tech, uh, VC, VC firm. I'm based in Bangalore. I've been looking at a lot of deep tech side of the things uh, over the years and uh, have invested in companies which are in robotics, in manufacturing technology, also in circular economy as a used car company, a used devices company. Uh, and uh, looking at health tech in a deep manner, uh, took a very deep uh, view at med tech, uh, all kind of IoT, a uh, bunch of biotech different companies. Uh, it could be cancer diagnostic, it could be something else. Uh, most recently, uh, you know, we're looking at very deeply into electric vehicle space and broadly into the climate tech space. So anything which touches climate, removes carbon, uh, alleviates carbon, it is something I'm interested in. Uh, recently offered a term sheet to a company in sustainable packaging space. And apart from that, I built a portfolio of a bunch of electric vehicle companies. Uh, you may have heard some, some of them uh, uh, from the media. But yeah, those are sectors which are interesting to me at this point of time. So broadly, uh, climate tech, 
डीप टेक हेल्थ टेक एंड लॉजिस्टिक्स के बारे में Thanks, Arpit. Uh, my name is Ashish Kumar. I represent Fundamentum. Uh, we are a scale-up fund, and uh, typically come in uh, after the first round investment has happened. So, I really want uh, everyone here to do well, do very well, because it is their portfolio that we typically get very interested about. Um, so, uh, we usually come in when there are, of course, the initial uh, proof of the product is there. There is some market adoption in the. the business and typically invest around 10 million 15 million dollar in a company in the starting uh, with with their starting check the areas that we have uh, usually invested in are uh, have been uh, you know many of the industries uh, that are been talked about but a little more recently we have looked at a uh, lot more b2b lot more fintech uh, climate you know is the larger theme of course where you know electric energy you know transition all of that is something that we have looked at um one area that uh, there is a significant first clear interest and uh, i come from a technology world of other technologies then became entrepreneur before i became a venture investor right so uh, anybody trying to do something with the new ai tools gen ai stack is something which is very very interesting we have made couple of investments in that space yet to be announced uh, and i think uh, this is where uh, we have finally india traditionally has been lot more services play right for the company which have sustainably scaled and uh, i think uh, gen ai stack uh, gives us an opportunity to create uh, you know lot more scalable service companies in 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 india for the globe for india and all of that right so pretty pretty much excited about that thank you ashish and arpit this is vinay uh, i run inflection point ventures at an early stage and fisis capital which is a little bit uh, later stage series a series b uh early stage um, about 200 portfolio companies good thing about us is we can look at idea stage we can look at uh, a poc stage and we can look at scale up stage as well uh and therefore we are sector agnostic stage agnostic um practically we've had successes across all sectors uh, whether it is let's say electric vehicle is blue smart in our portfolio uh you would have a if since you in bangalore many of you have used maybe milk basket uh right so that has been our portfolio today otp uh under that torch uh and and you know many others recently we've done a four deals in uh, drone space and i think one of them is an it madras founder as well um and we continue to stay uh, very i would say interested in healthcare uh, deep tech like uh, drones uh we're starting to look at space uh we have always we've done a lot of retail uh in the past uh and anything to uh, do with circular economy uh, you know it remains of high interest to us Yeah, lovely. Uh, this is Arjun here, uh, representing Special Invest. Uh, we are a pre-seed, seed-focused venture capital firm, investing in what we call deep technology ideas. It can mean many things to many people. Our uh, simple way of focusing on deep tech is 50% enterprise infrastructure, software, so AI, machine learning, cloud infrastructure, data infrastructure. uh security privacy dev tools is something that is super exciting to us built from india mainly for the global markets uh the other half of the portfolio is frontier tech usually at the intersection of hardware engineering sciences and software many many areas within that we've been early investors in space technology uh, uh have made five investments in space tech including rocket launches rocket launch companies like agni cool uh, earth observation satellite companies satellite communication now also looking uh, uh invested in a company that is uh building the future of manufacturing in space uh we have also done a fair bit in the climate sector starting with ev both ground mobility as well as aerial mobility the uh, done things on the recycling of battery side recently invested uh, in a battery cell company so fundamental infrastructure there a uh, variety of other areas now that we are starting to focus a little more on semiconductors we spoke about gen ai and all the applications that needs amazing chips right uh, and given the global geopolitical scenario and re- need to reduce dependence on china i think there's an interesting opportunity for india so semiconductors is a exciting space we have recently put out an offer to one company right with a differentiated ip we are also now spending time and starting to invest in biotechnology again usually you know sort of intersection between ai and biotechnology and data right which is very exciting so some of these areas super excited to be here for this conversation thank you so much gentlemen so now just coming to this topic of funding winter in way forward so the you know usually whenever a panelist happens we'll have a pre panel discussion 
So Lord of them very clearly said that yes, it is slightly tougher to get funding, but spring and summer is on the way. Don't worry. So first is don't worry. Life is not too bad. Okay. So so we, they're all here. There are many other investors. Go after them. So what we'll do now is again with the permission of the panelists, just a quick crowdsourcing of what would they like to understand or get to know more. Don't ask questions that you can find on Google or on their website. Those will be discounted. Sandeep, yeah, please. Just shout it out, buddy. I'm not sure if I can get your mic. Okay. Yeah, one question to both Arjun or maybe Arpit also on this pace tech, right? So what are your thoughts and you know how do you build conviction? Because it's so, you know, J curve is really, really, you know, not so visible, right? For most of the people who invested in a typical startup. So your thoughts on that? On the most only in space tech. Anyone else? Just raise your hands, ask for a mic, at least four or five questions, but as quickly as we can. No, no questions for VCs? Seriously? So there are some. Okay. Uh, hi, I am Sangarsh. So I've been on the startup side working with many of them, founding some of them my own. So we just think about uh, different cycles of VC funding. There was a time when there was a frenzy. Right now there is winter and possibly there will be an, an, an again a spring. How do you think about that? Okay, this is the okay. We have we should invest this much. Are we are we like burning so much? Are we asking startups to burn so much? Now we are asking them to see, uh, become profitable. So what's your thought process? What your mindset around this? I, I can't think of a better name for an entrepreneur than Sangarsh. <laughs> Sangarsh Karo sir, yeah. Fight it out. Any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, now is the time because remember at some, at some point of time I'll have to say there is no time left now. Thank you very much. So don't let that happen. Sir, one more gentleman at the back. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, hello. So uh, I, uh, as the funding winter will fade, hopefully, I, I believe that the VCs will be very conservative in, in what kind of startups they fund. And I also think that many of the startups which are probably just aping the developed nations in terms of the ideas, they may not get funding. Uh, because uh, in terms of conservativeness, I, I think that VCs will fund problems which are very native to India or very relevant to our own uh, uh, context. So what are the top problems that VCs think uh, for the Indian context are relevant and uh, will be higher up in order in terms of funding? Okay. Uh, this question is actually to Arpit. So I'm from the EV space. Uh, and I remember you saying that uh, investors typically look at uh, the least resistance, the pass of, you know, how does that fit in deep tech? Because the gestation period is long and what is that thought process there? Arpit, you remember this question? From, uh, sure, okay. I did not Thank prompt, <laughs> I promise I did not prompt him. Yeah, hi, my, my name is Amsavardhan. I'm a founder of a technology that is in the, that needs a manufacturing facility and I'm feeling a lot of pushback from all type of, you know, investors was saying you solve that first and then come back. I, I I'm not unable to outsource it, but why is there such a hesitance towards manufacturing? Because we'd all be sitting on trees and inside caves if we didn't have manufacturing. Why this? Why this fear? Thank you. Okay. Done? One one last question. Okay, maybe there's that's a it. Sorry, there's a gentleman here. This is a specific question to uh, first to Arpit and then to Vinay. Arpit, what was the motivation behind uh, basically taking on thought leadership? Uh, I see Bloom does a lot of thought leadership. So uh, regarding that and to Vinay. On uh, how did uh, Inflection Point uh, grew from a community of angels to a full-fledged like powerhouse that it is today? Okay. I would like to thank the last last question. Okay, Two questions in. This is the last question, final question. Yeah, okay, yeah, sure, sure. please, please, please. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vilas Deshpande from Wave Mobility. A question about space tech. How do you explain PMF and fund returns to your LPs with space tech? Okay, got it. Fantastic. So gentlemen, we are sorted to a large extent, but what we had said we would also share with the phenomenal folks out here was about the funding winter moving towards an asset. We talked about the investors needing to get the returns, get find the best of the best uh, founders. That's what everyone wants. So please, again, it's over to you, gentlemen. Take it as a conversation. You can take it in turns. I leave it to you all, whichever way works. So uh, funding winter is here. It is very much here. A lot of uh, so there are two things. Please put in context. This right very quickly running through this. <clears throat> a lot of our Series C, Series D, Series D kind of funding has happened by American investors, and those American investors obviously have options to invest into multiple companies in their home market. Now those companies, if they are delivering some kind of return, obviously the money will flow to those companies. And if the companies have started stopped delivering the return, they will flow to other markets like India. 
now they always also have a capital allocation problem so as you know there was a zero interest rate policy by by fed for about 13 years and only when the policy got over suddenly everyone found that uh, you could invest into other asset classes also as a consequence the money has gone away from american stock market and also broadly american private market uh, including our also emerging market private markets as a consequence uh, since late stage funding has become harder you see that uh, companies are basically finding it hard to raise money what has also happened in india however is that two years back and this is completely unrelated it could be maybe they are related i don't understand but it is it feels unrelated that the lot of indian companies internet companies zomato paytm nike etc etc have gone to ipo and the and the feedback from the market has not been all positive for most companies as a consequence there's a re there's a recalibration of what we expect our companies to do and hence there is a lot more focus on those things that will eventually matter because we know that all of us have to return exit at generate exit at some point of time so what makes an ipo work is another uh, feedback that we have received so what you see broadly very very broadly in indian context is a consequence of these two parallel somewhat independent trends thank you arpit um so uh, i invest in series b and i'll counter exactly what uh, arpit actually talked about here right so uh, i think uh, the funding winter spring summer you know i almost look at this as a cost curve right so it is not a sine curve because uh, as industry we haven't not not returned too much of capital so it never goes into negative but so it will go up it will come down a little bit and then it will go back up again right so this funding winter is actually a design not a bug right so that's one thing that i think everyone should kind of think about right that will happen every 5 years 7 years 10 years right the time horizon could kind of reset a little bit here and there right uh, but uh, just to kind of give you some data from uh, so india again like what arpit was talking about like late stage you know like 50 100 million dollar checks typically have been written by the western guys right and these guys of course have too many options other options so on so on so forth right early stage guy you know like funds and like uh, what when i was talking about 200 companies that he has invested in so on so forth so clearly there is no funding winter there right and i can tell you that you know at series b level last 3 months you know we have written more checks than what we have written in the last 12 months as an example right so there is some data and i know of uh, some of my other uh, you know funds who kind of we collaborate and compete with they have also done the same thing so i think this entire funding winter is kind of uh, maybe uh, maybe a thing of the past right what has truly happened though is that if you think about every time the winter sets and the summer or the spring comes back it does not come necessarily come back in the same sector so let's say if you look at e-commerce as an example or platform businesses marketplaces these guys actually got a lot of money because you know india in india there weren't too many digital distribution companies until zomatos and the paytms of the world that came in right and after that what will start happening is that there are different set of companies that will start getting created there will be b2b there will be fintech there will be electric vehicles there will be deep tech there will be ai based companies and so on and so forth right so so when you are thinking about uh, creating any company always think about that what is the why now for this sector and if you figure out that there is a particular technology there is a particular trend that makes sense today and if you are creating a company there there will never never be a funding winter if you look at generative ai as an example the technology in the us right and the same thing is starting to happen in india as well is that uh, last 12 18 months have been probably the best time for them even better than 2021 right uh, there is a company called servum that you probably may have read about uh, you know they have raised some 40 41 million dollars uh, you know uh, effectively as a seed right and uh, and i'm saying that some of those are exceptions but uh, many of those trends will start to happen right so we are investing in companies you know like which are taking advantage of the current uh, trends and the current technologies so that's one i think i want to give a sense of uh, the the funding winter there right now the second point i think there were a lot of questions around uh, you know uh, manufacturing and you know typically industries which require little little more capex right and uh, that's honestly a question that uh, you know uh, we in the industry also ask ourselves if you think about what has happened in the country last maybe 20 years or so right uh, financial services as a sector it services sector has done very well in the last 20 years 25 years then uh, um, i would say consumer not necessarily consumer tech right has also done very well you know like and what would happen is that looks like this is the time that manufacturing would do very very well right as 
maybe the people on this uh, stage may not necessarily be the best guys that that does not mean that there aren't investors out there right so one uh, uh, you know as a as a group that we have to figure out how to do that and the reason why we are typically not able to invest in capex heavy industries because the the time the money goes into capex and by the time the revenue uplift come you know it is a slightly larger longer term time horizon and uh, in and most of our funds are usually 10 year fund which means that you know when we are investing and we are looking at exits for maybe 6 year 7 year 8 year time frame right mostly and many of them does not fit into those uh, uh, those timelines but i'm sure that you know finance as a as a as a trade uh, as an industry would would evolve there will be alternate sources of money and at this point of time i can tell you that there is significant money available in manufacturing i was actually this weekend i was last weekend i was with a group uh, who was uh, you know they started a manufacturing business around 5 years 6 years back they were doing close to 100 crores of revenue with a order pipeline of 300 crores and all the investment capex that they needed was around 70 odd crores right and i was kind of scratching my head how do i get in in this company right uh, so there are things like happening so i you know personally very excited about how to figure out a way to get a participate in those opportunities thank you thank you so much <clears throat> i'll add a couple of things to what first ashish said and then get into answering the question uh manufacturing and and since I, i come from manufacturing background you know i spent 5 years with unilever and 10 years with ge right before coming into investing and but i can tell you today the where people want to manufacture is on the moon right why there's a huge reason about it right you want to manufacture all of your rockets on the moon because the gravitational force on the moon is very less the lo- cost of launching a vehicle from moon is far cheaper than from here you want to manufacture in the moon because you don't want pollution on earth right and that's why you will see you want vehicles to moon and back that are very 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 efficient very very cost effective and that's where tesla spacex etc are focusing sharply on making sure that our cost to get to moon and to back is very very effective and you know very 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 cost effective so the question somebody asked here right saying on the space tech if that excites you that you know all of your dirty stuff gets on the moon all of your manufacturing stuff is happening on the moon because life doesn't exist anywhere else other than earth right that should excite you enough and that should excite lps enough to put money behind you know manufacturing on moon and it's huge hugely beneficial earth our space station should be on moon it's it rotates around earth without any energy it's a satellite of earth why not right so that's the stuff we should be thinking about when we think manufacturing when we think moon and why we are doing there why why space tech etc i let experts answer more but that's kind of the first point i want to take from ashish on the funding winter i would say it's pockets you know you can call india as poor but india is not poor there are pockets of rich super rich and then there are pockets of poor and i think that's what both ashish and arpit spoke about series c and d onwards once you touch a 100 million dollar valuation and above yes it's largely the american money but before that there's a huge amount of opportunity we fund five to six companies a month right we have a portfolio of 200 only eight have failed so far right which is a mortality rate of only 5% right even on a such a large portfolio our average irrs are around 48% irr is what we operate at right that's what early stage should operate at right now this irrs are not available to anybody else in you know anywhere else in in the domain so i came from a tpg a private equity fund to an early stage fund right because i saw something very different happening here so at an early stage if many of you are entrepreneurs which we just saw with the raise of hands and you are early stage entrepreneurs there is no funding winter whatsoever if you are doing great if you are solving a big problem if you are adding value to somebody and if you can you know make something worthwhile you don't have to always burn money i mean services are a great way to make money do saas make great money why do you even need to raise foreign money nokri sanjeev bichandani never raised after series a series b they just went ipo right that is absolutely possible right so we don't even have to always think series d hoga ke nahi hoga are ipo jao na uske pehle right build a strong company right so so these are my two perspectives and i think that hopefully covers i think one more question that was that i'll cover for you as well is you know how has ipv grown uh, i'll tell you we never were built for growth uh, we were built to solve problems that were our own right we, I, we were solving our own investing problems friends came along they started investing with us they got a 80% irrs 80x returns they brought their friends and that's how the growth happened the word of mouth and the product led growth is what we did and that's what we do 
we don't have any other way to grow right so till the time we continue to deliver great returns do good job find great founders and invest right and exit right i think that's that's been our core uh, core of growth yeah no, i think a lot of points covered i'll probably on the on the topic of capital availability right of course at the early stage i do concur with everybody saying we don't you know right ideas get it there's enough capital for seed pre seed and maybe just right after that scale up means you have to have proven something and then you deserve and get larger rounds and therefore maybe that filter and that evaluation may have gone up compared to a few years ago because money was easier but the good thing about the lack of capital availability or lesser availability is you know i think like uh, we're saying sangarsh is, is at the heart of building a startup right and you know you're going to build a company for 10 years 15 years to make it lasting and value creation there'll be the odd cases where you'll you know get a good exit in 5 years otherwise it takes 10 years minimum to build a company in that if there's two years of a downturn or something should not happen most importantly the two years probably which the time we are in right now should teach us and force us to be even more innovative even more focused on frugality and efficiency which actually is at the heart of you know how new ideas come up because there are constraints and that like people to come up with solutions and therefore new ideas come up right so that's way it's a very interesting and a good opportunity for entrepreneurs and for everybody to understand that we can do more with less right i think when i spoke about saas companies becoming profitable earlier etc you know the whole world went after saas including all of us because they're supposed to have 80% 90% gross margins and 80% 90% gross margins and people losing hundreds of million dollars how do the two correlate we don't know but that's exactly what happened over the last 5 5 to 10 years so we got to reset and recalibrate and say hey, of course typically this is fun for ip right and innovation sorry or uh, you know customer acquisition right so now one has to start thinking deeper about better ip creation as well as more frugal ways of acquiring customers so i think those are uh the fundamental things maybe just to add on the manufacturing aspect if the manufacturing can be brought on as a correlation and an addition to the ip the manufacturing process itself has something unique and breakthrough and therefore the cost structures are different then i think vcs would jump at even investing in manufacturing that capex because we are we are known to invest in either ip or customer acquisition these two buckets you got to figure out where your manufacturing capex fits into so that's that's what i'd say maybe i'll pick up on the space tech one if that's okay a couple of people had asked that question right 100% agree with uh, what when i was saying in terms of what's exciting there right uh, on the lighter note it's an easy one to say just look at elon musk right and say just look if that is possible then you know there's a big future it can't all be you know uh, fluff right so use that as a starting point second question to ask is does india india have an advantage right at least for all of us sitting here that is super critical in any cutting edge area that we have to invest in right 41 million dollars in sarvam is about an llm for india right and that is unique and that is why the 41 million dollars otherwise it's not going to get it right typically if you just build yet another llm those hundreds of millions or billions have already gone right so one has to see what is india's edge and in space tech our heritage and history of isro is just phenomenal right it's just now about privatization and then bringing in all the talent pool that is there right pretty much all the and this is pan iit event so i can say that the iits have phenomenal aerospace you know programs labs and professors and you know therefore talent pool right the isro pedigree and background of why we know how to solve some of these problems right and then can we add newer manufacturing innovation newer software innovations newer engineering efficiency innovations on top to build better rockets to build better satellites faster cheaper better that's what makes the opportunity amazing in addition what has happened in the last 10 years is about you know satellites have become cheaper smaller easier to build and basically it is they do two primary things do communication or do earth observation and the magic of can we cover and visualize the earth every part of the earth all day long for 24/7 and we are so far away from that that is the opportunity uh arpit has a portfolio company that is trying to do that we have a portfolio company that and a few others that they are out there right and earth observation is a phenomenal you know 
industry agnostic use cases. There are plethora of use cases. Hedge funds use them, retail uses them, manufacturing uses them, supply chain uses them. Like everybody can use really amazing earth imagery, right? And then if you want to put those satellites out there, then you need launch vehicles. And if there are more satellites out there, then you need traffic management systems. It's just an ecosystem, right? And the value creation is just very, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it is in the tunes of trillions, right? You look at the full stack. And with that excitement, I think it should be easy for us to get excited as VCs, as VCs and definitely translate that to LPs. Sorry, a little long-winded, but I, I took a shot at that. So I've, I've got my warning signal that I've got precisely five minutes left. When I say I miss V the panel, but we should do this, right? We should give maximum value back to these wonderful people here. So very quickly, we, we were talking about deep tech, EV, space tech. Who's there in IoT, hardware, startups? Oh my God. Seven, no, seven, seven guys. Anyone? Okay, put your hands on. EV, anyone specifically on EV? Okay, space tech, anyone? Drones, space tech? Nobody. Gen AI or whatever you call it, LMs? Okay, one, two, three, four, fine. So I'm just, why, why I asked this question was, if we, if you, each one of you have to give, specific crisp remember four minutes left right to cover 35 seconds to make them fundable coachable at whatever stage early stage or you know series a series b what are the things that you would look at during these hundreds of conversations that you have which made you realize that these guys really know their stuff makes sense a nice nice question nice answer that you want to give to the folks here so whichever round you'll want to get yeah i think uh, quickly for us we come in at typically pre-revenue in a lot of cases even pre-product so we're basically dealing with a team, right? Which I would say easily takes up 50% of the, you know, decision-making, you know, the why, right? So what is, in, and particularly in deep tech, it might be true, uh, is why is this team best equipped to solve this particular problem? Which is what is the background from where they're coming in? Where have they found that, you know, unique technical insight and market insight? It could come from academia, it could come from work in the industry, it could come from, Source, but that depth, that fit, which I think in LR parlance is found that market fit to some degree, right, is super critical to us. So we're spending majority amount of time. Sorry, so we're spending majority amount of time trying to find why this team, and then I think when I also mentioned why now, right, is the technology trend at the right place for this team to go after it and to build something meaningful and then create value over the next five plus years, right? So for us team is really at the heart, so we're really spending time as much to understand why they're doing this at this point in time. So I'll add a few more things on the team. I think team is very critical for us at the early stage. Problem technically is easier. And maybe if you guys want to write it down, because this is how we actually do technically evaluation. Can you work hard? Execution. Can you think critically? Can you ability to think right? Join the dots. You know, challenge assumptions, right? Can you build a team? Will people love to work with you and people will die to work for you? Can you put the team together? Number four, can you network? Can you work with the investors? Can you work with customers? Can you work with vendors? Can you work with you know, your own employees? Can you work with the guy on the road? Can you work with your PM? Can you work with the board? Can you work with governments? If you have that ability to work with multiple stakeholders and understand those stakeholders, you have, you have it in you to become a great entrepreneur. Uh, Arjun already talked about technical capability. Right? If you're building a space rocket, you better be a space scientist. Right? If you're building a medical infrastructure, you better understand medical very well. If you're building an OYO hotel, you better have lived in OYO hotels or, or the, you know, the, the wrong hotels or the smaller hotels you know, to understand what's the pain point. Right? So a technical depth is required. Right? And then far more important is where is your heart? Why are you actually doing it? What was the pain point? What happened to your your kid or what, what happened to your friend, what happened to your brother, what happened to you, what you went through, what is your personal pain that you actually are driven by when you will not have money, when you have to work 24 hours a day, when your people are not with you, investors are not giving you money, why will you burn that midnight oil to do that still, right? So these five or six things, if you're very clear about, I think then we found the right entrepreneur uh, or the right person to run a company, right? Somebody asked us, why did you grow IPV and how did you grow? Because it was our personal pain. Right? And we've started working on it. It became a pain of many, many other people. Right? So I'll, I'll just stop there as a few things that we look at uh, from an entrepreneur standpoint. Yeah, maybe before I answer that question, you know, there is uh, something that when I had uh, answered uh, in the last question, I can't stop myself from kind of telling that when you're talking about uh, 
manufacturing in the moon i was kind of thinking to myself maybe the moment we start polluting moon will actually figure out that there's life on the moon as well somebody will wake up the <laughs> 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 uh, uh, coming back to this uh, i think i'll make it very simple right i think uh, the criteria for all of us irrespective of whichever stage and i can tell you this for even public market i've done public market investment as well it is exactly the same it is just that you go a lot more deeper down into certain areas you know because at a, let's say when we come in which is you know not necessarily the first check but that's the second check uh, we have more data so we will uh, value that data a little bit more rather than our own intuition as an example right so uh, uh, what we have done is uh, as investors we are usually very boring people we like to be boring people it's always good to be boring people right you know that kind of ensures that uh, there is i mean there isn't there should not be too much of adventurism there right so we have created uh, uh, something called what we call internally a p6 framework right so you know effectively the first p is value proposition is the value proposition uh, sign your whatever you are offering significantly better than you know, the next best one or not right in in the in the venture parlance they call it 10x the second one is profit pool which basically means that what is the market size multiplied by the gross margin profile so in the same industry you could have different business model which will have different gross margin profiles right so saas has 80% gross margin so services has a 40% gross margin as an example right so you know the profit pool changes depending on what you are trying to do third is people of course right and then of course all of what uh, you know when i said arjun said effectively can you hire people do you understand the market is there a reason that why you would win right why should i not be starting that business why should you be starting that business right effectively what is the insight that you have which is very different from you know let's say the people in the room that you're talking to right in general if the vc in the room knows more about you that in that industry the bad news for you right uh, so we 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 as people like to be told that you know i know i know more than you right because that's basically that's that's how our confidence kind of grows that okay even though we think that we are smart people and in and figured out enough number of things but you know like you tell us something more it actually gives us a little more confidence very quickly last last peak potential which is that you may have created something but that has not translated into revenue today but it may translate into revenue let's say 2 years down the line so on so forth performance whatever you have done in the last let's say 12 18 24 36 months right and uh, last is price right i mean after all of this uh, are you the only one who will make money or will we also make money right so that's the, that's the last thing that we think about I um, we don't have time, I guess. So let me just read from. There's a very famous poem. I'm sure you all of you heard about this. If you can talk with the crowd and keep your virtue, or walk with the kings, not lose your common touch. If neither poor or loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be man myself. So. that's exactly what entrepreneurship is about uh, there is nothing more to it than to just be at it and and don't die yeah. so can we raise a round of applause for this wonderful resources thank you so much gentlemen and uh, i hope that some of you have a few minutes more to kind of say hi if the before the next panel and everything remember rules of networking don't crowd them Say hi, exchange cards, connect with them on LinkedIn. Give other people also an opportunity to say hi to as many of them as, as possible. Agree, gentlemen and ladies, agreement on that? Okay, very important. That's a networking skill. Be nice to all the people around you. Okay, and thank you so much again. It was really insightful. I have gathered the thoughts. I really loved it, and I think we should always help the folks out here. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a wonderful audience. Great questions and great. some great interactions. Thank Big you. round of applause. And to Swadeep, thank you. who's a great guy. He also guided us a bit before the panel. He made my job so easy. I'm such a good moderator, right? I ask everyone for help, and they give it so lovingly. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you so and much. And small token and of appreciation from Panayi. Yes. Amazing. Let me give you the mic. <laughs> so as a, as a token of remembrance and appreciation, thank you. This is from Panayi. Thank you so much for being. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> thank you so much for your inputs. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And last but not the least, our favorite moderator. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, team, an important announcement. <laughs> we just have a minute, so while we set it up, 
the next session is up and ready, which is a live pitch, which is going to happen here. So please don't so, run away anyway. Stay here. So whoever wants to meet them, please meet them outside the room. Don't crowd the area. Yeah, I know a lot, a lot of a lot of you want to meet them. I know that. So we're going to take you guys outside. Yeah. So we have a handpicked the eight startups who are going to do the live pitch here, as we did in the morning. Please, I would like to request investors to come in the first few rows, so others can move little back. And uh, we would be having our investors in the first few rows, please. Thank you so much. बाहर बाहर है आईसी बाहर बाहर है Investors, please come in the first few rows. Nice meeting you, sir. Yeah, Any other investors, please come in the front row. We can give you the sheet for filling. Otherwise, we are all set to get started as we move forward. We are already four minutes late in the session. We have our first one over here who is into the teaching. All over to you, Mr. Loka. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Whether in a classroom or in a Zoom call, you might have feel bored, right? Maybe some of you are even feeling bored right now. My name is Lokup, and I come from a really small town from India, from pure Hindi belt. And I was one of those hundred bored students in a classroom. But I was lucky. I found a great teacher who used to have conversation with me about whatever I was learning in schools, physics, chemistry, maths. He kept me motivated. He corrected my concepts as well as English communication skills. Now, because of that personal touch one-on-one, -on -one, I was able to do better, got into IIT Bombay, and then since then running a 
successful life in general but millions of students don't have access to such a great teacher i was privileged enough to get that but millions of students don't and as a result they are not able to unlock their full potential now in order to have have such great teachers for all the students we need to train millions of teachers and that is neither financially or, or scalable so that is why we created an ai that in the image of that teacher that can speak with students verbally one on one and help them learn practice solve their doubts motivate them languify can have a verbal conversation about any concept with the programming data analysis machine learning sales business development it's as if you are talking to me and with that conversation languify gives feedback and motivates the students for their concepts their articulation as well as their english communication skills making sure the graduates are getting full and upskilled so i have a short product demo video to show you please click you guys can also try out the demo just have a conversation through our website languify.in So what I'm able to show you is a user journey from Upgrad, which has been our oldest customer. Where stood after teaching, let's say thousand students are in the classroom. A teacher is teaching them. Teacher can just make a conversation about it, like a Vijay that talked about entrepreneurship. So they can make a conversation about entrepreneurship, whatever we taught. For this specifically is how to increase user retention for Uber, which is extremely complex question. you can add any type of question objective subjective technical scenario based question and then the student has to verbally answer it it's proctored of course and based on the answer the next question is generated to ensures unique conversation for every single student out there it analyzes your answer in real time and it gives you quantified as well as qualitative feedback and data points for the teachers as well it shows you a transcript what you have said um ah uh, pillar noises it gives you feedback like a teacher would give you where did you go wrong what can you do to improve as well as it rephrases whatever you have said into business perfect english now i come from a hindi built background so i my accent is still there my way of talking is still there but whenever i practice with languify it gives me perfect english what should i have answered also we give them quantified ratings for their communication skills as well as content with improvement resources which they can see and refer and improve themselves with and students love using languify after uh, over 6000 students have used languify from colleges their communication skills their concepts grew that led to them getting 20% better mm -hmm. sorry 20% better salaries uh, we have been operational and we have received 2 million dollars in signed lois and 100000 dollars in committed revenue from giants like upgrad monster iid and recently we have been uh, used we are in live in uh, europe as well as africa uh, learning is all we do whether online or offline so our conversational ai which is in the image of a teacher can be used in school as well as colleges in corporate lnd that makes it a huge opportunity and we are the perfect time to build built it uh, we are iit bombay based alums who previously exited to a us based company we have been working together for the last 10 years with cumulative experience of more than 15 years we have been backed by great advisors in teaching uh, machine learning engineering as well as curriculum uh, development uh, through our advisors we are raising a round of 700000 dollars as a seed round to help us boost our revenue from 100k to 1 million and we have raised pre seed capital from european investors as well as indian vcs so please join me in providing a teacher that cares for every student out there thank you questions, questions. <laughs> i'm here please use the mic so people thank you for the wonderful presentation how long did it take for you personally when you went through that mentorship 
to get to a stage where you are right now? I would say I'm still learning in a lot of sense. That's okay. That's what I said, to the stage where you are right now. I would say at least eight years uh, from my early eighth class. And then in college as well, I found a great teacher. So around eight years of continuous hand-holding, more or less. And with this product, what do you expect? So that is so what we're similar. If the same, if you if you were to be the same person using this eight years ago or whatever, ten years ago, how long would it take for you to get to this stage with your product? So that is our vision to be that teacher which I had for millions of students. So with this, we are right now incorporating in university. We provided from the first day of university itself. So every day, student learns in classroom, and then they have a verbal conversation about whatever they learned in their college. So students are not just studying one day before the exam, rather than they're forced to have a conversation about whatever they learned. That ensures everyone is paying attention because everyone, they will never procrastinate if it is linked to directly exams. So around a year, I would say. My question is, right, it comes down to uh, self-motivation versus something that is forced upon you. So because you are self-motivated, you are very keen on learning. So if this is enforced by parents, enforced by college, how many, how many people would be? I think that is the key thing for your success. Absolutely. I love that you have asked this question. Any tech product in education, the biggest challenge is adoption. With us, the retention is 50%, engagement is 70%. That means if a professor is telling 100 students to have a conversation with Languify, 70 students actually submit it one time. They have a verbal conversation one time. And out of it, 50% students, around 30, 35 students, they practice the same assignment two to three times. Now, why would a student on Friday night practice the same assignment two to three times? Because that is the gamification we are built. So something, imagine something like Duolingo, but better, where we are pushing poor performing and average performing students to have conversation. So for example, uh, look up, your score is just 40. But if you have one more conversation, your score will increase from, from 40 to 70. Now, for a poor performing student, this, this is the biggest motivation ever that, hey, I can increase my score and then I'll get best of two. Mirko assignment mein 70 marks mil jayega. And then I'll be topper ke saath mein runga pe. Right? And same motivation everyone gets because, and we trick them into practicing more and more. And more conversations you have, better you become. And by virtue of having conversation, your confidence goes up, your communication skills goes up. Of course, your concepts get improved. That is where you get the marks. Thank you, Loka. Um, Thank you. Thank you for time. So we are time up. Sorry for that. But more questions can be answered outside. Uh, investors, I'm hoping everybody have the sheet uh, with you. Please write your name and uh, and then we get started on the next one. So we have uh, Vikas here yeah. as the next one. Over to you. Good luck. Yes, thank you. We want to use the upward arrow. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are uh, B2B vertical SaaS in that, in that language, uh, part of legal tech, a little bit different flavor uh, with applications of deep tech. Uh, we're trying to. Uh, <laughs> We're leveraging AI to uh, bring down time to decision in patent related matters uh, sizably, and we'll talk more about it. Uh, because of the topic, I'll spend about a couple of minutes just establishing the just establishing the problem statement, because uh, some of you may may not be uh, uh, you know aware of this. Now, patents are uh, a key metric of innovation. Uh, sometimes the only metric once the dust settled down of you know the business of innovation. Uh, it used to take typically uh, about a million dollar R and D to get to a patent. Industrially speaking, earlier the technologies have changed; it has gotten better. But the point I'm trying to make is, it's typically the leadership that gets mandated to uh, to take decisions at you know various levels of uh, at various stages of product development that they're doing. And the way they do it uh, today is uh, they ask the the senior engineers uh, who go to patent attorneys in the corner office, and then you know, in-house patent specialists outsource it. 
to law firms, outside counsels, uh, uh, information specialists. The whole cycle time slows down your uh, your speed of innovation, and uh, uh, the more the more this is needed, uh, the more the the problem gets. We have been in this area for some time. Uh, as I'll introduce myself in the in the teams team slide, and we we identified this problem to be solved, and uh, we we'll, I'll talk I'll talk about why why we think it needs to be done now. So we just put a team together here. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the good pedigree where they come from, but besides that, I think they have a relevant uh, industry experience. This is one of the teams that you will see, which is which is heavy on experience, uh, whether it be in the patent domain, on the software development, as well as uh, uh, on the data sciences area. I, uh, along with some of my co-founders here, have been running a patent services, patent analytic services business for over a decade. And... Uh, uh, essentially, we are productizing the service. Now, being in the being in the space uh, helps us get the customer connection. I've had some large corporates as my customer, GE, Philips, Airbus, you know. Uh, but really, uh, it's also about understanding the need, the criticality, and the, and the urgency. So why now? We have been at it for some time. In fact, the day we we got into this industry, we knew at some point in time we needed we need a way to. Uh, to, re to reduce our burden. You know, you're looking at any idea you talk about, you're looking at 4,000 documents, 5,000 documents, and uh, uh, the criticality sometimes of not only accuracy, but the comprehensiveness of his searches and analysis creates a problem. So uh, we're hoping we can leverage all that experience that we have into this uh, uh, into this product and which we are building. Uh, no. Uh, OK, so let me go to the next one. So, what I had done was I had put them as a line item so that you could see one by one for recall, but unfortunately, I'll, I'll do it this way. Uh, this is, uh, in a nutshell, the status. Uh, and each of them have more material behind based on the questions that you may ask. I will I'll try to answer that. The goal and driver I talked about, market $7 to $8 billion, just back of the envelope calculation. The reason why I say it is US and Europe as the originating business is because you know this whole business of you know, uh, Patent as a business strategy is something that has you know come from there. A lot of due diligence gets done in India, though, but you know the originating the decision makers are still there, so that would be our market. The solutions, uh, yes, the knowledge about uh, so it's a technical legal field, so a knowledge about patent domain rules is definitely uh, critical. But uh, what has actually changed it and why now is the large language models which have come up. We believe some elegant solutions maybe. Possible and it's uh, the products are going to be the workflow based. So depending on the question you're asking, for example, you could be asking whether my idea is patentable versus should I launch the product in this uh, in this country versus you know uh, uh, somebody has sent you a notice. How do I kind of respond to that, saying that you're infringing on my product or infringing on my patent? All these need due, need due diligences, and there are about uh, 140 million patents to date. Uh, every year, three million are getting added. So you just need to go through, and it's a like I said, it's a technical legal document. So where you can't, in some of the workflows, you just can't make a mistake because it will come to haunt you, right? So uh, a lot of that knowledge comes from here. Where are we as a status? We started in Feb uh, 22. Uh, we created an, uh, an MVP, went to our customers. I have access to them, like I said, through the service uh, uh, that we had carried. Uh, we got some good testimonials, went to the VCs, tried to raise funds. Uh, more or less, I was told, get some customers on board. MVP does not sell, so you've got to make a product. So we pivoted, identified the free data. So by the way, the data here also takes takes money. We'll, we'll have to buy the data for every country. Patent laws are national in nature, and every country uh, uh, handles its own data. So there are providers who kind of collect it and sell it to you. So we did a US data-based FTO, which is called Freedom to Operate, one of the workflows. And we are uh, ready to launch it anytime right now. Uh, in terms of uh, target, our ARR is about two million in uh, in the 18 months that you're talking about, and this is based on two workflows that we're talking talking about. More anyway, if you ask, and and we believe in uh, in five years we'll reach the 20 million ARR or you know roughly uh, 50 million uh, 100 million valuation. IP, we are IP folks, so so we know whatever we are doing, we've already protected as a as a provision in the US and India with a possibility of Protecting worldwide, and uh, finally the ask is a real-time event office. 
650k is what we are asking uh, uh, essentially for the data for uh, uh, the infrastructure that will be needed obviously trainings and uh, things like that that has to be done uh, and the marketing and you know uh, uh, sales in those areas we are hoping that first one or two million is that is something that i have been doing as a service uh, more i could do it myself uh, and you know some of our co founders so that is where we are thank you any questions from the audience or the investors yes please most than welcome just out of curiosity do you have patent yourself and did you apply that for this product yes so i've been uh, a technologist in r&d about 30 years i have about couple of patents myself uh, and this is something we have written the patent that we have applied is, is something written by us because we have been doing that for several years so you know that i mean we are in industry insiders here what kind of due diligence it, it actually reports uh, so the for, so there are uh, due diligences of an idea happens at multiple levels so you you can have an idea and you actually search for the idea in the patent database uh, for novelty and there are depending upon where you are when you are filing you are checking for novelty non obviousness and utility the three basic principles for for any patent to go through uh, but if you are actually wanting to know what else is available you probably have to do something called a landscape you want to make sure that around that technology what else is filed what, who who has that are there white spaces in the technology then you actually go there and and try to occupy that it is a strategy patenting is a strategy and uh, not always you patent just what you are doing you may always you may also patent something around it so that tomorrow when you are trying to grow nobody comes and kind of you know becomes a roadblock so like i said i mean which is why leadership is typically involved because it's not a decision that can be taken by the inventor most of the time thank you so much thank you so much for your time thanks. and the clicker thank you um, so we now welcome the next one here jain sai over to you Uh, you need to pick up the board. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. We have been hearing lot of tools, artificial intelligence, business intelligence, and analytics, data science. There are a lot of tools available in the market. and therefore you get a lot of reports dashboards which your organizations have to consume the problem with these reports is they provide lot of these reports but then getting a business actionable is very very difficult we as a company address two things one geni flash our product gives you business actionables two we help organizations to improve the adoption rate currently let's look into the data analytics challenges often it's a very involved process bring in any bi tool there is a developer who has to make these reports right they have to make the reports for the business user who has to spend lot of time to analyze what it is and has to make part of his daily routine that's the first thing second thing is when you hit up a target let's say the supervisor is monitoring a tool often minutes are tracked right the data analytics tool is different and your action tools is very different minutes are tracked and uh, you don't actually visit this when there is another review meeting you come and revisit these uh, minutes often it ends up in a chaotic discussion people end up being uh, you know justifying why there were you know inaccuracies what led to the poor growth and so on right so this is a problem that is you know faced in many organizations despite having a strong data science team despite having a lot of tools in place as per gartner right 70 to 80% of bi initiatives end up failing when i say bi this is artificial intelligence led tools as well when i say failure it is not uh, the tools are ineffective the tools are made perfect but the business users don't get connected to this right that is always a challenge so now what we did is uh, we approached one of the leading um, brazil manufacturer customer so this is our anchor customer as well so when we approached them they were using power bi as a tool the sales team is struggling to get insights there are a lot of reports 
but it doesn't they don't connect to these tools because they have to spend a lot of time to understand and uh, often they track things in the spreadsheets so that uh, they can quickly make sense out of it right so when we approached uh, this company uh, through the top management we uh, you know um, uh, were part of some of the sales review meetings and then come up with a quick automated solution so we have automated that provided a insights essentially what we did is we transformed the organization into three levels one at the individual level you could see there are quick a pointers let's say rajesh is a sales person when rajesh logs into the tool he gets okay this is what you need to do right instead of you looking into several metrics rajesh you do this thing for a quick improvement and we also connected to rajesh in multiple uh, ways we provided video tutorials and then we also provided gamifications once these things are tracked right their supervisors also get a tracking mechanisms so which means if i don't do things right my manager will get to know things right and he can track things and then um, you also get things until it gets closed and then there is also a management review at two levels so the entire thing is driven by the organization and the most important thing is you get a coach and recommendation so this is what the value addition that we have brought to this company now what that led to us the product genie flash essentially we do three things first quick actionables there is a user who connect to this tool he gets to see what he has to do instead of seeing a bloated report and dashboards that's first thing second thing is we eliminate the developers and middlemen right you as a business person need something you can simply ask why is my sales going down what should i do to improve my sales by 30% uh, increase you get an insight directly and third and important thing which is very much important is it has a coach and uh, uh, customized insights functionality as well with this we are able to improve the productivity bring down the uh, expense right because you don't need a data science team you don't need a report developer the tool plug and play the ai learns from this right and absolutely there is no development time right plug and play the tool learns specific to the user let me play a small video the flash is an ai driven insight tool with automated ai powered dashboards for accelerated business growth the summary page starts off with a high level summary of how your business is performing an update on the ai inferences jenna flash is an ai driven insight the, right? the market size is huge that is 130.45 million dollars we are an office in us and um, india to seize this opportunity so while the competition is crowded in uh, bi space where we differentiate ourselves is our a capability so there are guided insights self learning ai and uh, ability to track things until you get a closure so uh, our beach is manufacturing we are focusing on organization with dealership uh, focus we have uh, 18 customers now at this point of time so we are targeting 320k us dollar uh, this year and uh, you could see that growth would be tremendous in 2024 25 uh, reason being of working very much closely with anchor customers murugappa and uh, renault nissan our ask is 500k us dollar we have a strong team put up at it mentors research park uh, myself and rajesh it and with 18 plus years of experience parvati uh, with 12 plus years of experience or ask us find the kst and uh, let's enable organizations with genie flash thank you any questions any questions from anyone fantastic thank you so much mr rajesh Okay hi good afternoon everyone my name is Vani and I am here representing a company called Vet Instant Healthcare our interest is in improving animal healthcare across the world but uh, like all big ideas we want to start small and our interest is in starting with dogs and um, quickly taking you through some data as to where we are in the animal healthcare market <clears throat> if you look at uh, there are four households for every 1000 households in uh, india that have a dog 
um, and one household for every four households has a dog in the US. India is where US was 30 years ago. There's, there's um, 5,000 pets per vet in India, 1,100 pets per vet in the US. The vet community is exhausted, the work-life balance is crappy, and uh, the infrastructure is, uh, is, is feeling the stress. Uh, in fact, the U.S. has started reporting suicides as, uh, as a result of the poor work-life balance. But what are we looking at? We want to improve animal health care. We see a lot of focus in uh, investment by pet parents who are, who are a part of a large trinity uh, of three, which is the pet parent, the pet, and the vet. And here the pet can't speak for himself. And uh, when you look at uh, the pet parent, there's a fair lot of infrastructural issues. There are a lot of fence sitters when it comes to pet parents in the marketplace. And the pet parents are busy investing in, you know, even when they get a puppy in the house, you see them investing on collars, on leashes, on pretty pinks and, and uh, lovely blues. Now, what we are trying to do is to try and get the attention onto the healthcare side of things. If you look at the number of vets, Matt, to pets, look at the chasm that's there. And that's the chasm that we are identifying as an opportunity because this market needs to be digitized. Of course, there is current digitization in the marketplace, but uh, it is uh, improving, say, say, two or three percentile of the current problems that are being faced by either vets or by pet parents or finally, of course, pets in general. If you look at the current market size in five years, it is, uh, it is looking at growing 8.92 crores and this is only for cats and dogs uh, mind you uh, this is not for anything other than small animals uh, <clears throat> uh, our sources are mentioned here uh, there's a fair amount of SOM the uh, CAGR is pre-COVID in fact it has grown post-COVID to almost 30 plus percent uh, you know and um, if you look at what is the big problem here the big problem is that of the data which is a pet is unable to communicate a vet gets conjecture and punt from a uh, pet parent because we like talking about our animals like we like talking about our children. Um, and pet parents are not always alert. We are busy in our daily lives. There are times that we tend to ignore things, misplace data, things go overboard. And our solution for this is really the exam D. It lies between an ecosystem of two applications really, one with the vet, one with the pet parent. The device that you see at the center is the exam D. It allows you to do non-invasive temperature measurement, non-invasive SpO2 and pulse measurement, heart and lung auscultations, which are only done correctly by two percentile of the uh, vets nowadays. This is all being done to improve the quality of healthcare. This product comes like a kit and it allows you to take these. We are asking pet parents to take a step back and take the data with respect to their pets in their own hands not it's pretty much like you know if you have a fever you pop a crocin but with dogs you can't operate like that they need these uh, basic vitals for any kind of decent diagnosis and prognosis we are working on a bunch of exam variants but the one that is currently ready is what you see as uh, the pet owner light version which is the basic emr access today if you come to our stall across here you will see a product that uh, works with two applications and gives you a basic set of data and allows the fulfillment from till from prescription consult and at home uh, conversations with your vet with the vet of your choice because no pet parent likes to go to any other vet other than their own so we offer the choice of your vet this is really our business model which basically says we are looking at uh, financials that are based off not just device sales, but also basis services. There is, um, we're looking at preventive care plans and consultations. We have conversations going on right now. We have 50 pre-orders right now in a month. We have five enterprise contracts, which basically mean that we take a percentage of uh, medicine sales as well as consults online with vets. Uh, we have one research validation center where we get more than 800 dogs validated, two geographies which are being managed, which is basically uh, north and south of India. We have uh, five enterprise contracts with those specific uh, folks in uh, Chennai as well as Bangalore. We have a lot of them in the pipeline in terms of Bangalore. We have individually te uh, trained 50 plus vets on the use of the device and the applications and downloading of the material. Uh, we also have 310 plus users and counting. This was done almost three, uh, almost uh, three, four days ago. So we would probably have doubled the number by now in terms of instances of device usage. This is our uh, fund ask of 4.5 crores. It works across marketing, product manufacturing, people and software development. 
we are very excited to tell you that we do not have an alternative in the marketplace and this is globally i would also like to tell you we've mapped our competition fairly strongly in the global scenario as well as the india scenario all the brands that you could possibly think in the pet care market that are to do with healthcare technology and digitization don't really exist and finally we are working very closely with iit madras and their procurement center to start our production between sirma as well as foxconn sirma is more likely foxconn is too big a large number for us uh, but our certifications are in progress our manufacturing uh, we've already got a bomb and development right um, our ips we file our patents and these are workable patents what we mean by that is these are patents to uh, on the functionality of the product not just on the design of the product so the design and functionality have patents we filed a pct we would like to see a launch in in the international markets in the next 18 months we have a deadline of 2025 on that okay that is our product roadmap that's just to tell you and i don't think it's readable but uh, uh, it works from the exam d which is our first unit we also have a bed bowl and collar which is a smart uh, set of devices. Uh, beyond that, there is a urine test, which is again a device that is work in progress. We are testing it right now at the Pondicherry Veterinary University. And beyond that, there is the virtual platform where all the data goes online. And so vets can see the data at any given point at the click of a button on their phones. That's what our revenue roadmap looks like. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but that's the people behind this game. There's Vivek, who's a chartered accountant, self-taught wet and tech guy. That's me. And then you have Raj, who's our product designer, doing his M tech. Thank you very much. My time is up. And uh, those are the others. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions from the audience? Sorry, any questions? Happy to take them right now. Yeah. Any questions? Anybody? Investors, audience? Yeah. We have one hand over there. Can you yes, pass please. On the mic? Hello. Uh, sorry if I misunderstood, but are you connecting uh, people to the vets also, or is it just the device that you're selling? So it's the device and it connects vets. So there is a trinity in the pet care market. It's the pet parent, the vet, and the pet. Okay. All of them get connected. The device is just a means of sharing data versus conjecture with the pet, with the vet. With the, because pet parents tend to talk stories about the vet. Right. So the device is not uh, easy to use for the parents. They need the vet's assistance to use it? No. Okay. It's a at-home device, so it's very easy to use. In fact, the in-market products today are very expensive and not available to a pet parent till you come into a clinic. We are asking pet parents to take a step back and telling them to start using this device like you would a temperature thermometer for a baby in your house. So this device is, however, a five-in-one device. Not only does it do temperature, it does SpO2, heart rate, heart and lung auscultation as well. Yeah. Got it. Thank yeah. you so much. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much. So in the queue, we have next data Z. Uh, we have uh, Rohan and Sandeep here. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. My name is Sandeep. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Datasep. Along with me is my co-founder, Rohan. Uh, let me quickly get started. The biggest problem that we're addressing is just one engineer, one data engineer for every 10 to 15 companies. And it is only, this is only getting worse. And when companies start to do data uh, processes, they start off by maybe implementing some uh, very haphazard way of a BI tool. It's getting some CSV files, etc. But when people try to take this more and more further, what they end up with is a series of tools that are so difficult for any one single person to make sense of. And this causes and uh, makes companies to keep on changing and improving their data infrastructure at least three times in seven year journey. It's a lot of time opportunity for the companies out there. And, and the business teams suffer by not getting access to data on a regular basis. And they kind of learn to live with it. We are, we are set to change this by giving one single interface that makes it easy to ingest the data, process the data, store the data, and make it query ready. Query ready in the sense you can attach a BI tool and access the information to make a chart or a dashboard. You can attach it with your ML notebook. You can attach it with a uh, 
internal apps kind of a application or, or do anything you want to build over the top application with the data the biggest usp that we are making it possible which no other platform can claim is that one single person who knows sql can manage around 2 to 3 tb of data for a company so that is what we are making it uh, easier with our approach and it doesn't require engineers to start with and the stack is very clean and easy to use and the data assets will be easy to track the quality of the data assets will be easy to track making it ready and available for people in the company especially business stakeholders in f under 5 minutes uh, just to visualize the application anything to do with raw data that is you have different saas sources and databases backend like mongodb and postgres and sometimes object stores like s3 to doing anything with the consumption layer that i just mentioned you just need one single application that is data zip uh, we have also kind of understood that a uh, lot of people struggle with understanding and making sense of data how to what what all they can mix what kind of use cases that they can kind of come up with uh, so that businesses can have a lot of use for that data and we are leveraging uh, ai and especially llms uh, to be able to kind of be a co-pilot or a assistant analyst that you can ideate with challenge uh, use it to dig and find more information about the data in that direction we have launched data zip uh, uh, zip ai as part of data zip uh, we are a team of uh, people who have been in data for some time uh, and have individually experienced these problems and when we came together and talked about our shared experiences we were so puzzled that each of them each of us had the same observation and that's what led us to start data zip uh, rohan especially was at was the first data get rapido so the scale of the uh, from five cities to 90 plus cities set up the whole thing himself because he was the first data guy and that experience is what we are using to productize and make it easy for more companies to get quickly started and grow faster uh within 7 months of our launch we have had more than 25 plus companies trying trying out our product in their own environment because that's the way we deliver the uh, deliver the application uh being in line with all the data privacy and security concerns people have about data uh we have kenko health moengage pagarbo kind of companies already as paying customers and very interesting companies like whatfix and line chat are already doing poc with us uh and uh, like i said you have only two alternatives right now either buy a set of tools which are very costly to kind of keep paying for or have at other spectrum have a ton of engineers who are like very specialized and difficult to hire and retain to do the job of data engineering for you or you can just come up come and use data zip which makes it easy for anyone who knows sql to operate uh, we are uh, first targeting companies which have less than 2 tb of active data uh, and then we'll step up our product to slowly be able to address more and more data from companies thereby going from uh, like startup to mid market right way to enterprises uh, we are very because we are deployed in the client's cloud uh, and we kind of are very close to the engineering teams our pricing is very much like how aws charges uh, like their ec2 or kind of their infrastructure so very similar manner uh, the number of machines that run uh, decide the capability of data that you can process and the pricing also varies according to that uh, we are already at uh, 38k arr right now and uh, by the end of this year we will reach 50k arr and our plan is to kind of unlock 100 k arr by march next year and from that we have a plan to reach uh, a million arr by uh, next 12 to 14, 14 months our ask is we are raising 500k round right now at an idea stage we raised something like a 220k Uh, we are part of alchemist accelerator one of the top 10 uh, us accelerators and uh, we have a demo day coming up next year as well for that and uh, we uh, we are you going to use this money to uh, perfect the product uh, uh, to a uh, even more uh, degree and also spend a lot of a little bit more time on uh, building the brand and the use cases in terms of sales and marketing thank you what what are the vertical markets that you want to focus on and where do you see the biggest opportunity initially we are focusing a lot on the tech companies uh, people who have at least 5 to 6 uh, technical folks uh, people who know how to run 
cloud, uh, it could be DevOps engineers or engineers, at least five to six engineers. That's a good sweet spot for us to start. Uh, so tech companies is one domain. We are not going pretty much into legacy companies like manufacturing or uh, maybe any other uh, legacy verticals because we have seen slow adoption over there. And uh, because of that, we were able to basically crack uh, companies from right from seed stage to unicorns even in India because we know exactly where we want to target. Uh, customer builds it. So we are a horizontal product. Uh, we are a pure play infrastructure product uh, priced accordingly uh, based on the infrastructure itself. Our differentiator is majorly on the performance. We are today itself three to five times faster than Redshift. Uh, we are 12 times faster than Athena itself. 70% uh, of our users create first dashboard within first week. We are that easy to use. The whole deployment happens within 40 minutes. So we are 10 minutes slower than Domino's, that's it. Within 40 minutes, you get your infrastructure set up. So that's our differentiator, and we keep doubling down on that. Yeah, thanks. Hi, the next team is uh, Morph Electric, uh, convert IC engine for two wheelers vehicle to fully electric. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm audible. Yeah. So, thanks. Uh, IIT and organize for giving a uh, mock electric such a uh, opportunity in this grand location. So, as the word uh, more suggests, it's transformation, right? So here we are transforming petrol two wheelers to fully electric. So the EV EV adoption is is going full throttle, right? But there are some still some questions like how fast and how much is the EV adoption? So the EV revolution has begun. But what happens to the already existing petrol vehicles? What happens to their owners? How do they transition to electric? So these are some of the questions that we at MOF are trying to answer. Sorry, guys. So vision is to make sustainable electric mobility affordable globally by retrofitting the petrol two-wheelers. And our mission is to convert 1 million petrol two-wheelers to fully electric in the next five years. Changing the world one bike at a time. So these are our team. Myself, Dr. Venkat Nuri, co-founder and CEO. I have a BTEC from IIT Madras, PhD from Georgia Tech. I worked in Honeywell for 10 years in the aircraft engine division. Then went, went on to become a faculty at SRM University. And that is where the humble beginnings of MOF began. And with me are my students who worked uh, with me in university. And then we have Ravi Tejareti. He was the project lead there in the school in the college. He's a university silver medalist and he worked in Ather for two years before coming full time in this company. And then we have Raghu and Chatrakant who are design, test engineers and operation lead. And we are very fortunate to have great mentors. We have IV Rao sir who is a distinguished fellow at Terry and is ex-head of engineering for Marthi Suzuki. He's an industry stalwart and veteran and he's currently the expert panel member at uh, advising Ministry of Road Transport on national EV policy. And then we have Swadeep, everyone knows him here. He's, uh, he's actually my batchmate also at IIT Madras. Then Arvind Tihal is our EV expert. He's again my batchmate. And we have Kausup Donde. He's the CEO at Autonext Automation. And they are building a first India's first self-driving electric tractor. So if you look at the problem statement, I mean, this is the thing that touches the whole uh, crowd here. I mean, most of us drive vehicles, two wheelers, four wheelers and all. But so we let's, let's look at this person, Arun. Okay, he is earning less than 60,000 rupees per month and he travels typically 30, 40 kilometers per day. And he's having a hero splendor, which is a typical uh, bike of the masses, right? And, and, it's, uh, it, and uh, it's already run like five, six years and it has uh, mileage issues creeping up, you know, and uh, maintenance issues coming up. So he's thinking of uh, changing his vehicle. And what are his options there? He has either to go and buy a new petrol vehicle or he has to go to an electric, a new electric two-wheeler out there. 
and of course when i mention electric two wheeler it is a high speed two wheeler okay so if you look at the costing here if you consider the cost of ownership so if, if, if even if he sells his petrol bike for 20000 rupees he still has to put in like 80000 rupees for a petrol bike to buy actually when i talk to some of the uh, 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 urban company people right service so people the, the ac technicians or car pet carpenters or plumbers I and mean, they are having the bikes that are running for 17 20 years i asked them why are they not changing they are telling that the the petrol has gone up and even the bike costs have gone up recently right and so even they are not moving into brand new petrol vehicles and forget the brand uh, new uh, electric vehicles they are much much more pricier so if you look at the cost of ownership which includes the upfront cost and the running cost it comes out to be around 1.4 lakhs in the two years right so this is a pretty big number and that guy is still thinking what to do and here comes mark and gives a great opportunity where we are saying okay you don't sell your bike we are going to uh, upgrade it and uh, with a 60000 rupees conversion kit and including registration and insurance and uh, and we have it done for like half the cost of a brand new electric two wheeler right with all the state of the art features and good performance and that's a great deal for arun right so these are retrofitting solution we have this existing petrol bike we remove the engine and its components then we put our modular conversion kit that's our usp we have created for it and then we get a fully electric connected bike because we're giving iot and mobile app also and the benefits of retrofitting as i mentioned it's usually affordable because we are reducing reducing the its 50% of the cost of a brand new electric vehicle and also we are giving the low running cost and then when it becomes affordable the masses move in and it accelerates the ev adoption and it's a much more uh, greener solution because we're actually uh, extending the life of a vehicle and moreover we are removing petrol vehicle from the uh, on the roads and actually putting back an electric vehicle so it's having double impact and this is the it's a 40 billion big market i mean it's no guesses there right so we are having almost 1 and 1/2 crore bikes sold every i mean not bikes two wheelers sold every year and of which 30% of the market share is actually by the 100 cc bike segment of hero motors so we are going to focus on this four five variants of hero motors and anything old older like 5 plus years old that's what we are going to pick and that's like a 50 million unit and it comes out to be like 40 billion dollar is our tam and we are just going after this 1 billion dollar initially okay and if we have done a lot of surveys and demos here and and we have seen that almost we have done like 1000 surveys and we have given some demos also of our product and we have around 20% plus people who are actually interested to not only retrofit but also actually pay the amount of 6000 rupees here and and we are so and we are very happy and encouraged that we already received like five pre orders during this exercise and this is the competition and just a, just a note guys uh, we have a lot of ev players in the market but there are very few players in the uh, retrofitting segment and we have only one guy here gogo evan and our product is very uh, highly scalable and highly serviceable and we are also giving at a very good cost with better features and all and this is the current traction we have built like many prototypes and this is the final product four we are working right now and this is the road map so we have to get our product certified in march and then uh, and also in august we are going to go for scooter uh, segment retrofitting and this is the business model we are going to make it easy for the customer you just have to give it small uh, down payment amount and then just a uh, uh, pocket friendly emi there and this is a go to market strategy we have both b2b and b2c segments and for the b2c segments uh, one of the most novel thing we are trying to do is use the bike mechanics as a sales and after sales guys so we have got very good uh, uh, appreciation in the newspapers and uh, we have got government incentives to support and we also found one uh, formed this iara uh, automotive distributors association that we are trying to help and uh, so our ask is like uh, one uh, four cr i mean now current company is valued at 20 cr valuation we have already received 1.7 cr here and uh, and we have, and, and we have a great opportunity here everyone so let's move let's disrupt thank you Thank you, Moff. Any questions here? Yeah, we have in the audience. Quickly, just quickly, can you talk about the infrastructure for charging? Like, uh, typically, somebody who earns that kind of salary, where will he charge? At home. He can charge at home because uh, he has it. It's a regular three-pin plug that the and you can charge it at home. It's But like if you're staying in an apartment? Apartment. We will provide the service at the ground floor. We'll our team can do that. I uh, one question. Uh, one question related to your usp of your product you know retrofitting is good i think you are letting go of building a new bike but is your usp the battery tech that you are building or is that your 
IP or you are sourcing that from elsewhere as well? No, no. Actually, our main USP is most of the retrofitters out there actually do it by cutting and welding the chassis, right? Here we are doing a uh, plug and play type product, and uh, because of which uh, the cost of uh, conversion and the time con conversion is drastically reduced, and moreover, the serviceability. Because if you uh, if you modify the chassis a lot, the regular mechanics will not be able to work on it. But on our retrofit kits, uh, on, on the bikes that we retrofitted, 90% uh, of the problems can be actually sorted by the regular mechanics, the tire punches. So, so the battery you're sourcing from another third party? The battery design is ours and we are going to give it for manufacturing. Okay. What, one more question that I have is, most of these electric bikes, bikes have a you know conveyor or rather the belt type of you know the mechanics. We are doing chain driven. Like We are just using the Hero's uh, motorcycle chain driven uh, transmission. Okay. Thank you. So, so, yeah. so the module that you put in, what's the life cycle of that? How long would that last? We are giving like a three years warranty on it, like the regular uh, uh, OEMs, but definitely they last more than three years. We're expecting at least five years there. We already driven like 10,000 kilometers without any problem. Thank you. Oh, friends and family. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Noi. No, it's not a hybrid. It's a fully electric. It's a fully electric, and we are having, huh? Yeah, yeah. So we don't want it now. It's complete transformation, like the caterpillar to the butterfly. They don't have any relationship, but they are from the same place. But we don't want the fossil fuel again. Actually, it's more complicated having a hybrid system. It's more complicated. Two systems, heavier mileage drops. You know, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Morph stall is outside. More questions, please go over there. Thanks uh, very we much. <laughs> would like to welcome the next one here. Uh, please come. Greetings from Calder Health Technologies. Uh, we are a deep tech healthcare startup on a mission to make people breathe better. So, uh, uh, audience question now. So, uh, raise hands if people are personally or have known each other, anyone that has been having symptoms like sleep apnea, headache, frequent sinusitis, or a whole. Show of hands, please. Okay. So, do you know what potentially causes all of these sufferings? There's a condition called deviated nasal septum, where basically either of your nostrils is getting deviated, which basically obstructs and you have to only breathe through the other nostril. So this is called as deviated nasal septum. And the one of the gentlemen who raises their hands in the back is my co-founder, Hari Shirin, who's been personally suffering from this condition for the past six years. So how does he manage this with similar, like other million people is that he uses this for every five hours where he wanted to have this product everywhere he goes, because without this, he cannot breathe. That's how he's dependent on this medication. And also beyond using it for a certain time, what it causes a condition called as rebound congestion, which will basically obstruct the nasal passage completely. And you have to go for surgery. That's the only option you have. And otherwise, you have to go for invasive surgery, which is very painful and also have a very post-procedure complication. So we validated this as stakeholders by meeting 55 people across India who are doctors, patients, and relatives through a, through a uh, program called as GDC IIT Madras, which is a structured customer discovery program. And we have validated that there's a need to empower these ENT doctors with less invasive non-surgical option to permanently treat this condition. So the magnitude of the problem is large. When we did an opportunity assessment, we found that one out of 15 people needs to go through a medical intervention because it's an anatomical deformity and you cannot manage it through a medication. You need to go through a procedure. But in India, currently only 4.5 such septoplastic surgeries are happening, but the prevalence is around 87 crores. Out of this, around 10 crore people could be system, symptomatic. So there's a huge gap here. But still, when we come up with a less invasive option, we are seeing that they can able to come forward to take this procedure. That's when we invented Swasm, the solution for DNS. So in this Swasm process, the doctor will perform an endoscopic examination to understand the septal deviation of the patients. And then he'll be applying a local anesthesia. And he'll be inserting a balloon unit. And with the guidance of the endoscope, he'll inflate it to correct the septal deviation. And he'll then insert the balloon unit too. 
and he'll inflate it to rigidly hold the septum in place and applies the configured electromechanical reshaping potential for 15 to 20 minutes and then he can deflate and retract so this will basically reshapes the biological architecture of the cartilage resulting in the change so the value we offer for the doctors is that this is a non surgical treatment option which can be performed within the clinic of an ENT doctor and not require an operation theater which significantly reduces the healthcare burden and also since it's less invasive it's going to encourage a lot of people to come forward to take the procedure where the doctor can enable to treat more patients who even have low to moderate symptoms for patients it's going to provide a long term relief without any pain during procedure or recovery and also will enable them to continue working with the day to day activities and not require any to take long medical leaves which they are taking now so we are a patented technology and the differentiator is that we are a non thermal heat heating procedure which will you know substantially reduces the tissue damage and also will able to fasten the recovery process so that huge technology upside to us because we wanted to also extend this to other cartilage reshaping procedures like ear knee cartilage voice box and as well as for cartilage grafting and this can be also be extended for a lot of cosmetic applications as well we have a clear product development pathway in alignment with our regulatory strategy where we are partnering with rifc venture center to get our cdsc approvals and as well as the iso 13485 to do our human trials at aims jodhpur by june 2025 initially we'll be focusing on the healthcare tertiary centers and as well as the ent private hospitals in hyderabad chennai and bangalore as our market then we'll be expanding to the top metro cities and also for the other tier to ent private hospitals we are a b2b business where we have a one time sale of our parent device at 12000 usd and we'll also have a recurring sale of our balloon unit with every procedure for 240 usd and also we calculated that our customer lifetime value will be about $100,000 we have a potential to scale exponentially even now we are in the regulatory phase of it and we are need market approvals to make it into a market but once we get that even with just 0.5 percentage of market penetration into it will be cash flow positive and within conservative market share of 10% we can start to become a very highly profitable business we are solving a global market need so starting with india about a market size of 180 million we set to expand to europe and us with the consecutive regulatory approvals from these countries and we have a total market size of 1 billion note here we are just assuming the septoplasty surgeries which are currently happening and we have done the systems we are an interdisciplinary team with experience in biotechnology ent and uh, uh, medical device development myself tilak have a bit of experience in strategy fundraising and as well as in medical device development my co-founder hari comes with a background in biotechnology who has well versed with biological assays and also non invasive deep medical device development dr amit goyal is our chief clinical officer who is the, the professor and the head of ent department at aims jodhpur who is going to be our clinical mentor in doing our product validations and as well as our clinical testings and he is having more than 20 years of experience and is a key opinion leader so we incorporated last december and within a span of one year we were able to file a patent and have one and two national level competitions and have selected for two startup accelerator programs and have raised 46.7k usd from incubator and government funds and also we have interacted more with more than 32 ent doctors so our ask is that we are raising a pre seed round of usd 200k and with this we'll help to accomplish our pre clinical studies and secure our regulatory approvals to get our product clinically tested and also to build a skill team across design regulatory and as well as in the product development So join Caldas Mission in revolutionizing respiratory healthcare and make people breathe better. Thank you. Let's all take a breath and talk more. Thank you. So, uh, in preclinical settings, right? Have you tested this on any animal model or a three D simulations of real time responses? We have actually tested it on extracted cartilage tissues from goat, where we have developed the proof of concept and. We validated that these cartilages can be reshaped, but we are now moving forward with the animal model now. This is a live animal model. That's what the next phase of testing is going to be about. Now that we have to basically do through a simulation of the animal model, and since our human anatomy is very different from the uh, any other animal model, we are now doing it on the ears of rabbit. Now the next phase of animal. trials with that results we'll extend to a simulated studies in the human anatomy that's where we are going to focus on the upcoming time uh since like the round that we are raising now is going to help us to do our animal model studies as well the pre clinical studies one so typically in the next 6 to 1 years what we are looking at we really have to conduct these studies thank you um thank you so much thank you yeah we have next sensio the last one over for the session
Um, please hold on. After this, we have a tea break. So one last, and then we all go over there. Hi. Uh, my good or bad fortune, I'm always the last one. <coughs> is this? OK, uh, my name is Venkatesh Vade. Uh, I'll, I'll be pitching for Sensio. So we make wearable AI technology for health and wellness. So when you say wearables, most of you probably think smartwatches, right? And it's, it's blowing up. It's exponentially growing. How many of you have heard of smart rings? OK, I do see a few hands raised. So uh, the other part about it's, it's an up and coming form factor, let's say. And the other part about this is when, when most companies have built wearables, when most companies have built wearables, it's mostly about I, me, and myself. What we are doing slightly differently is we are taking an empathetic view and saying, let's build a device that not only helps the wearer of the device, but also the family. So I think we need to see how this can be done. Let's, let's look at that. So let's start with the problem statement. I'd like you to meet Mr. Amar Nath. Let's call him Amar. Amar is about 65 years old. He's recently widowed. He lost his wife to cancer. His only son, Vinesh, lives far away in New York. He lives alone in Mumbai. Now, Vinesh loves his dad, and he wants to check on his health regularly and frequently. But as of today, he has no way to do that. Right? Move over to Ankita, the other character. Ankita is all of 18 years old. She's a star performer, high achiever. She's getting into Harvard. But she has a chronic health, uh, a heart condition. And her mother, Karishma, really wants to check on her regularly. But she has no way to do that. And I think that's really the problem we are trying to solve here. If you zoom out a little, we find that the health and wellness spectrum is really afflicted by four Ds. A 4D challenge, demographic, deprived sleep, distance, and data. Distance separating family members for either work or study relation reasons, and data, not enough data when we really need it. So in our view, the real solution to this situation is a comfortable, convenient, continuous 24-7 wearable device that can give you actionable health insights to you and to your loved one. So Sensio has developed this smart ring called Orbit. It comes in various sizes, textures, customized designs. It can put a world of health data at your fingertips. It can do up to five vitals. We can do a sixth one soon. It can do heart rate, respiratory rate, blood oxygen, temperature, ECG, and in the near future, we hope to do blood pressure. Our competitive advantages are many. We are snug. You can wear it and forget it. This is a, an early prototype of our smart ring. I'm just wearing it on the little finger because it's one size small. We do the widest range of sizes compared to competitors. It has the best signal because of the high perfusion and medical grade sensors. We have a proprietary in loop feature, the feature that helps family keep in touch and non-intrusively check on one another's health. We can do ECG as well, which gives us a special cardio focus. We can customize it to one's liking. We are sleep compatible, we are screenless, and we are very simple to use. The Orbit Smart Ring is launching soon. Uh, it's stylish, it's sophisticated. It can be your piece, it can be your zen. It's waterproof, you can shower with it, you can scuba dive with it, you can wear it by day and by night. So you can also measure your sleep with it, so it can do a good lot of stuff. This is how we stack up with respect to the competition. Uh, we believe we are mid-premium, that's where we'd like to be. Uh, we are competing with the more premium rings on value, and we will compete with the lower end, the white label rings in terms of features, capability, accuracy, and so on. We are one of the few who, use, who uses medical grade sensors. Our target groups are here as shown. Like I said, we have an ailing Amar in one of our target groups. We have a caring Karishma. And a caring Karishma could just not be a mother, but also a social empath who's always ready to help someone in need. We also have the why not Wazir, you know, someone ready to try the next evolving emerging tech. And we have the fit friend Fiona. Of course, the fitness segment is the most widely open now, but we certainly can do that also. We, we do have an IMU, we can do activity sensing. It's so common, so we don't brag about it. 
this is roughly the market size. I'm sorry if some of you can't read it, but uh, in summary, when summed up across all these segments, uh, it adds up to something like four and a half billion rupees. That's the Indian market. The global market is about, uh, I'd say, five to ten billion dollars and growing. Uh, this is a slightly zoomed out bigger view of Sensio. We are not a one product company. We are more than that. And I'll talk briefly about the next one. Uh, as of today, we are organized into wearable products, medtech innovations, and we also do a little bit of R&D consulting. Uh, so essentially, we are an Algo, AI, and IP-driven company. We have four patents and 11 trademarks filed, some PCT as well. And, and that portfolio is growing. Our next product is this chest patch. Uh, it can do pretty much everything the smart ring does, and it probably does it better at the, you know, on the thorax because it's closer to the vital organs. It can also do heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen, temperature, ECG, and uh, the combination of these two can really track blood pressure, uh, I think, pretty well. Uh, although this is a little more med tech use, that means, you know, it, it's good for you, ICU like home monitoring. Uh, this is a medical grade product, so this will go through regulatory. Uh, compliances and things. So it's a longer term roadmap. Just want to tell you that. That's why we're focusing on the smart ring now. This is the team. Uh, I'm the chief executive. I look after tech, finance, IP, and strategy. Kenneth is the head of all software technology. He also helps with this dev and process. Mohan is the head of all hardware technology, design of experiments, data, and compliance are some of his other forties. Our advisory panel is bigger than this, but we have Sophia Anand, an IMA grad, as our chief business advisor. Uh, Michael Foley, a well-known designer from Bangalore, is our designer. Dr. Vimal Bhardwaj from the Narayana ecosystem is one of our medical advisors. We have more than one. And of course, we have advisors in legal, business, and uh, finance, etc. Our ask today is uh, for a pre-seed raise of 250k dollars. That's about 2 CR. Uh, we have raised 2.5 CR already till now. Uh, and of course, we have been you know, doing our product development and burning through that. Uh, this is going to be primarily used for a go-to market for clinical trials, um, for also you know further evolving our products uh, across the spectrum. That's pretty much it from me. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes, please. Yes. Sir, uh, the allegations against ultra human are that they post employees, they even got proprietary information from investors. I think those are serious allegations. To start off first, we have our own design. We have our own IP, right? And uh, uh, we are not one of those white label guys, you know, selling a Chinese ring. We know many are doing that in India today. It took us three years, solid three years to develop this. So, uh, and of course, we have protected our markets of interest also through our PCT application. So I think uh, we have protected ourselves and we are, in our opinion, we have even done FTOs with our legal advisors. So uh, I feel we are okay about it. We have to look at that, I guess, in... We are using uh, basically patented sensors with the permission of the vendor. And after that, the design of the product itself is ours. right? And uh, I don't think we are copying any particular aspect because a, a, a charge has to be, you know, it will be viable if one is copying specific type of idea. I, I think, you know. So I don't know the specifics of that case, but yeah. <clears throat> Uh, maybe I can suggest if you can have a conversation with them. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Yes, yes. yes. Not, not only heart condition, right? Okay. But this uh, boy also ha is neurodiverse, right? So okay. does your ring also have any GPS capability to sign off? You know, she's always concerned about missing him or he'll be stranded. So, does so it, it doesn't have, but doesn't we, have we probably at, at a future time, you know, because electronics are constantly shrinking, we could perhaps look at that. That's, it's not out of the question, sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we will have Thank a you. 10 minutes tea break and then in the next room, uh, 
we'll have a uh, next session about uh, speed dating. So those who are investors will be doing the speed dating. They can go to the next room. After 10 minutes, we'll start that uh, session. Thank you. Hello everybody, we're going to be starting a new session.
we have two more sessions after this okay and uh, we're going to be starting in another maybe less than 10 minutes okay less than 10 minutes and this is uh, it's a surprise i think you guys have already seen in the panel i think you guys know who he is but he's somebody who's built swiggy from almost so from scratch to a large large huge company that it is he's going to talk about how to build a product a world class scalable product
going to be um, universal. So any kind of companies that you're building, they may be helpful. Some of them may not be helpful, but so take them with a pinch of salt. This one. All right. So, so this is what I do right now. Um, so I'm the CPMO at uh, Jupiter Money. I've just joined two months back, so don't ask me too much about what does your company do. I'm still learning the ropes. Um, I lead product management, marketing, design, growth, analytics, a bunch of functions which are truly non-fintech. So these are the ones that are required across all companies if you want to scale. Um, uh, previously, I had led uh, uh, you know, growth at Swiggy. I was there for seven years. When I joined, it was just a two-year-old company which was uh, selling some food in in a few cities. So we were not, or Swiggy was not really that big. So my role essentially, and the way I see it, is how do we grow this company to 100x? Uh, so we were, I remember the day that I joined, we were doing like around 30, 35,000 orders. And today, uh, I think we are, or Swiggy is currently at more than two and a half million, something like that, in that range. Uh, orders in India. <coughs> was a snap deal before that, um, leading their buyer experience. Buyer experience, this was a product and, and technology role. Um, I was there at Walmart as well. So Walmart, I, I obviously could not grow 100x, but the, the lens always is, is that how do I grow this business to, to many, many times. Uh, I was leading the store services, photos, pharmacy, anything basically that can be originated in the store and that you have to deliver online or it can it is originated online and you have to go to the store to collect. So all those categories were under me. And then yes, the most exciting experience was with Flipkart um, back in 2010. So I was the first product manager there, leading the buyer experience there again, again with a lens of growth, uh, we were selling like around 800 books a day when I joined for a small, cute e-commerce, not really an e-commerce company either. Like we were just like a book selling website and, and we were doing a hundred X by the time I had, uh, I quit. So some idea around scale and growth. Um, well, I did not want to start the talk with, uh, calling it growth because growth is such an abused word. So we call it scale, but we really tricked you into that because we are going to talk about growth. And we are not going to talk about like you know beautiful ways in which you can scale your company in terms of technology. That's not what we are talking about. So masterclass is going to be applicable to most of uh, most of us, either if they are building B two C companies or they are thinking about growth or they are thinking about product or generally a, a good way to understand uh, how does marketing product everything fits together and what are some of the best practices at least from my point of view that I've found. All right. Okay. So this is going to actually take me through the links. Can somebody help me here? All right. So what are we not going to talk about today? We are not going to talk about, uh, you know, PMF. Product market fit is a completely different ball game. It's a completely different way of, of thinking about products. You try, you fail, you iterate, you find some special market segment that you go after. The playbooks there are extremely different. So no gain about that. While some principles may apply there, but do it at, at your own risk. So, so that's the first thing. Product market fit stage is different then the stage of growth, then the stage of scale, right? So how do I know that this is working? That's a product market fit stage. Most new product ideas will fail. It's impossible to predict which ones will work, which ones will not. There may be some probability that will be attached to them and so on, irrespective of how senior experience you are, unless you have found some extremely clear insight that you're gonna work on and build a product that really works. But at scale, the, a few things that I've seen uh, you know, the, this is called the death cycle of, of products. What happens when, when different companies are already operating at a particular scale? Um, and, and usually, and this is almost true for 90% of the companies that I've seen, observed, helped, like they look at their growth that it is flattening. It seems like, hey, what are we going to do about this? Let's try to do something. Let's build more features. So, so you start adding more features. You start thinking about uh, maybe my consumers will start loving it and so on and so forth. And then we just launch uh, and we, we think that after launching these features, uh, our, our users are going to love it, but the launches keep getting smaller and smaller. You launch and, and you think you need bigger launches, even bigger products and so on. But what happens? Initial spike comes and we think it's working. Okay, good. We do some A-B testing. We, we figured out get, uh, that, hey, this is working and so on. And then again, we start seeing growth flattens. And you know what is happening in this time? The reason why I call it growth cycle, a lot of people think of this as a, as a Growth cycle. It's not a growth cycle. It is a death cycle. A-B testing your way towards growth or scale is essentially letting natural evolution take care of your product. So selection by natural evolution will lead you to some good answers by A-B testing, but it will take billions of years before your product becomes like very successful. It's not that easy. 
you have to think about about it in in different kind of frameworks if you have to really think about a b2c company or even a b2b company in terms of how do we grow hmm how do we go so where do we go from pmf is just a simple uh, you know fun slide that we that i put up around that there are so many ideas that come to to different people ki hey should i build this small feature should i build this large one should i build for a different segment and so on but uh, prioritization is hard you need to absolutely focus on the prioritization so here are a few ways in which i have realized uh, how that uh, how you can simplify some of these things i'm not going to cover everything in detail but a few tidbits if you want to take from from today's talk i think literally start from the user so if you have built something think about that user understand that kind of user very very deeply a lot of people call them segments a lot of user uh, of us call them personas and so on but really think about a person rather than a persona and that is super important it's a very very interesting way and an important way in which some successful companies have have really mastered this i've used that at swiggy we've used that at walmart and so on in fact i'm going to give you an example of walmart so before somebody says ki you know what if i just think about one person i'm going to build like an entire product does it work uh that's why i'm going to take a, an example of walmart like there are like walmart has basically one third of the us shops at a walmart every week so it's that big but they think about their customer segments and like these six customers if you are going to solve for these six remember these are not only personas they are actual people um if you are going to be able to think about your users distinct real humans with their needs and desires and aspirations and where what is their family life what is the journey how do you think about that person in specific and if you are building your store experience or if you are building your um you know sales experience even for that kind of person if you are building your app journeys for that person and so on just imagine that person and not only a persona don't think about a segment get to a person and imagine it for them and build for that uh the other way to use personas is that once you build for that it's not going to look very different from from some other apps and so on there's a concept called blast radius so if if this kind of person is going to work for you then uh you know a blast radius which is like hey people who are 20% similar or 80% similar to that your product may work for them also okay so that's one quote that i really like of ravi mehta who was uh the product head for or cto for tinder like basically <clears throat> when you build a product for millions you build for none but when you build a product for one you build for millions so this is probably one of the key insight that i want to take or want to talk about today any kind of company are you building think about one kind of pers uh, one person build for that now again there needs to be some marketing some intelligence that need to go on in your mind to imagine ki literally is that is that person in the blast radius so small that there literally exists only three people like that no don't be that stupid think about that person as a representation of a segment and build for that so again take it with a pinch of salt but really do not go solving for 80% problems of this segment and 80% of that segment and, and so on you really need to make choices a good way in which walmart did it and i really recommend that is that we in fact call these personas with uh, uh, you know adjective names so we said uh, uh, the first three people that we are building for is modest mata and we actually wrote you know money is tight she earns only $40000 uh, probably divorced and has two kids and so on money is and and a lot of that right and so another person that wants to shop at a walmart is a frugal stuff and she's frugal she's not uh, she's not really tight on money but she wants to spend that way and then one is savvy sasha remember all the three are women that's the primary personas of uh, of walmart and again this is 2012 a lot of that has not changed this is when i was there at that time we had built that and these are secondary personas have you So when we build a product or even a store was designed keeping those personas in mind, and we basically said, will it work for these three people also? So yes. And then we built eighteen other personas and said, this is for a rich person, this is for a person who's a kid, this is for a per for a person who's a very elderly, and so on. Some of those things you can accommodate, but some of them you'll say we are not building for them. And this is like really all of the use that we are talking about. You can still do that. So think about your business very sharply. You may be uh, getting a lot of surprises once you evaluate your business kiske liye banaya so all right now moving on to the to the second uh, you know lesson of the master class <coughs> the way to think about all products building in fact all companies building is that all the journeys are starting from an accepted customer belief to a desired customer belief 
what is an accepted customer belief uh, an accepted customer belief can be about that category that you are that your product operates if you ask any customer about that category what do you believe about this category what is true that's where the status quo is now you need to really crisply write down that persona that we talked about what will they talk about after three years what is their belief that they need to have about their about your category and your company and your product and if we are if if that belief is changing if you are if you are able to actually move that belief to the desire to some belief then your product and your company is extremely successful so think about this very very carefully and there's working backwards from the desired custom belief if beliefs are not changing then those customers are anyway not buying your products from you or they are not happy or they are not clear and so on articulate this very well and i've seen again a lot of companies just fail at that they don't even know what a persona in my category believes about my category and believes about my company and believes about my product even worse they don't even know where they want to go and where they want to go can be like a very large vision and so on so forth it can be that but no just write what is belief that you want to see i have actually not captured a few things here while you you will write about beliefs but beliefs are not something you can measure what you measure is behaviors so you need to also write down what is the typical behaviors that you want to see in in your in your customers that will lead to this belief being true um, all right cool so but i hope businesses were were as simple and if you can just like look at customers and personas and the belief systems hack into that and they will become extremely successful uh but growth is way and scale is way more complex than that you need to think about your business holistically you need to make sure that you understand what are the uh the other nuances of of the business and those are called growth loops and those those loops essentially is like a working business model of your business if and and remember these are for amazon and uber the largest one of like two of the largest companies in the world and they were both built on a paper product or or paper napkin very simply one when bezos was sitting in a coffee shop like hey if i am able to get <clears throat> uh, for example if i get lower cost structure it will lead to low low, um, low prices that will deliver a great customer experience lead to traffic more traffic will get me more sellers and they will drive more selection so it's a complex growth loop but it's very simply put on a paper i have you thought about your product like that and this again b2c b2b it does not matter have like a clear understanding of of how your entire product loop works or the growth loop works well i have had the chance to do it almost every year for for the companies that i worked with so it's not as if just a theoretical exercise i'm going to show you something that i built for swiggy this is a little more complex than the one that we had there um but but then that clarifies in fact if you go to the previous one this growth loop uh, diagram for amazon does not apply because now they've added another wheel of or another angle of aws and also for prime so now that looks a little different but the point is not that you have like great mathematical model describing your growth model but the idea is you yourself mentally understand what is driving what and then keep focusing in, um, on the right things and eliminating the, the areas that you don't want to work on this also helps in scale because look at for example uber and i'll give you an example of uber like around uh 7 years back and then for example when they realized ki hey i need to get a lot more customers uh, on my platform and they had all the incentive structures working on that and uber was a very very customer obsessed company in terms of number of rides but extremely not driver backward company at all uh, and so on and they were not growing and and they figured out like hey what is really happening was that like while i'm getting more demand and they were only concentrating on more demand uh, and more drivers were coming uh, for some time and then till the time those drivers were not coming they were not actually getting faster pickups and the growth loop was breaking uh so then they actually said you know what let let me try experimenting on something else so move all the incentives to drivers like like a lot of incentives to drivers and it turned out that consumers did not need as much incentives they all they wanted was faster pickups and more geographical coverage and that led to lower prices and all of that right so so you need to be able to like put all of these things together and continue experimenting around your scale so it's very easy to kind of lose uh, uh, you know control of which areas to scale if you create the entire thing you will be able to scale in a very very balanced way so that's my approach well, this is for swiggy but like i said like this is slightly more complex um, the growth live will also kind of make sure that we are putting swiggy one program at the center of it it starts with new users how many of them will we acquire how many of them will we uh, retain 
how many of them will keep on going dormant like we are not really an, a company which has like extremely high amount of stickiness because people can really like turn over to zomato and like or what not and just get to another um, another app but if you are able to build this then you will be able to understand your scale at different points and all of these are points of massive failure so you will be able to identify key why is my scale not coming which is the area that i'm not focusing on enough I'm not going into like the growth means customer acquisition marketing pns and all of that of course that is a part of that but but you have to like look at it more holistically cool um now coming back to users so now that we have understand accepted customer belief moving to desired customer belief we have understood think about personas think about the overall growth ecosystem another way to think or another lesson in the master class is ki first we have to understand the hidden truth of modern internet users uh and this is more of a b2c but it is again as true in in b2b probably more true in b2b uh you need to understand that a is your product truly really compellingly differentiated and needed if it is not there then then you may need to reconsider what you are building differentiated and needed maybe for a very small uh, customer base it's okay but you understand that that need very well if you're not then you'll probably have to play the game of hey, hey it's a it's a very it's a product that everybody is is also building you need to play the game of like cheaper acquisitions and so on to make it build that is also fine but uh, but really a mental model that i'll i'll coach around which you can think is that we do not uh, okay so we have to think about the customer who is extremely short on attention span imagine them to be lazy selfish and vain so these are the operating keywords so imagine that persona and and if you have to attract that persona you have to put like these three adjectives on top of that so which are these adjectives okay we can there right lazy selfish and vain lazy modern internet consumers are very lazy and again maybe i'm not all of us are modern internet consumers when i'm saying lazy lazy in terms of trying out a new product they are lazy it's like i don't have time for that you may write like elaborate copies and beautiful collaterals and like you want to attract them they don't have time for that the attention span is just gone it's the inter, you know tiktok instagram reels generation and it is it is worsening so the attention span that you have for especially in b2c for uh, uh, for getting a new user to try you it's just not going to be there so a your product needs to be differentiated so that it even has a chance to stand out and b your marketing or your uh, any way that you want to acquire the customer needs to be so sharp so that you can catch the attention of this extremely low attention span user who is anyway lazy uh so don't do elaborate onboarding don't delay the experience or delay in the in experiencing the product so you do a lot of storytelling hey five steps before you show you the product don't do that um build a self explanatory product explicit onboarding simple quick succinct attract those customers your marketing has to be on point so okay the other one selfish so modern internet consumers are also very selfish what is in it for me uh can you show them instant gratification delayed gratification ke din chale gaye a lot of people want instant dopamine hits if i do this action what are you going to give me if i actually go and and download your app is this something at the end of this tunnel uh and can you make me imagine that if that is desirable i would so think of it like that if you don't if you haven't built your product like that uh think about it these are simple ways to think but but usually you'll uh, you'll miss uh, many of them because we think of of our products mostly as matrix driven uh, hey which matrix are, are are they going to move and so on and so forth so a lot of these things get deprioritized but if you put on the selfish hat and think about i have to create an aha moment for my users as soon as they on board um the third one vain and this is probably the biggest one vain means okay the users have vanity vanity means they have a particular habit and and here you come with your two bucks product and you are asking me to change my habit like okay how uh, you know self important of you but you have to think about your users as whatever they are doing they are doing they have been doing it for years or maybe months and so on and so forth so a, a product that is sufficient uh, sorry it's for you may not be sufficient for a user to change their habit so you if you take these three lenses and again this talk is not to discourage any of you uh but if you take these lenses you will look at your product in a very very different way you will think about this for b2b companies now think about the persona that you're selling to 
most B2B companies are who? selling to CHROs, CFOs, some VPs and so on. Imagine a person and imagine that person is lazy and vain and selfish. Selfish is very He needs to show something uh, not only for himself but for the company. And then you think, how am I going to even reach that person? And how am I going to change his belief? Uh, and then I'm going to make a cell that really works for them. So you need to think about it uh, around that. Okay. Bowl them over quickly for vanity. And many times, difference in your products on top of the funnel is greater than down the funnel. Let me explain what that means. Maybe you are uh, you're running an e-commerce company. So top of the funnel meaning, if I can get you said, hey, beautiful coupon, and you'll get X percent off. Works on selfish works on Wayne, uh, yeah, hey, of course there's something in me uh, in this. So start using that action on or from the beginning rather than that coupon will appear towards the end of the funnel when you're on the cart and checkout and so on. So don't do that. So remember for a Wayne user, you want to start showing them value early and often and really hook them on that part. And again, these are some learnings that I have from my few companies that I've worked with and also like consulted, uh, usually seem to be in the right ballpark. All right, so a few things that um, that most companies kind of uh, think of that as, uh, and I'm, I'm going to reiterate this, um, think of that as afterthought. Afterthought, especially users onboarding. If you look at like the top 100 apps in, uh, in Android store, and if you look at like actually historically, the biggest drop that you see in retentions is actually first time usage or first month we call we may call it D30, we may call it M0, whatever that is. If you get 100 users to download your app, the average place to retention is less than 12%. People download and, and they just go away. Uh, some people will retain. And, and here, like, yeah, sure, like a lot of people are doing that. That is the largest place for you to make an impact. Like you can, if you were to make that 2x, like imagine your curves or your smile curves going from there till, um, till the next one year. The biggest hack happens when you are onboarding the user. So there's a book that I recommend to everyone. It's called How Brands Grow. Again, not scale, How Brands Grow. It's by Baron Sharp. Uh, there's the two parts. Um, if I ask this audience, if I have to look at two things, acquisition or retention, which one is more important? Let's start retention. Retention? All right. Acquisition. Very few? OK. So that's a trick question. Both are important. Uh, it depends really on the context. But if you have to put your marketing dollars in acquisition versus your marketing dollars in retention, now that's a different question. Retention. Marketing dollars in retention. Okay. Marketing dollars in acquisition. Okay. Marketing dollars in activation. Okay. No, not many people understand what is that. But yeah, uh, and this is not a global truth. But usually, if you have to spend money, spending money in acquisition and activation is almost like the analysis has been done. Like you can actually read it in like a few of these books and papers. It's a way more effective way to actually get users and 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 it's a much better spend than, for example, putting money in retention. And there are a bunch of theses that come here. Uh, one is like a very it's a tautology, which is brands which are big also have like a larger word of mouth also get more people irrespective and their loyalty will be high. It's a very counterintuitive way of looking at things. But again, going back to the topic that we were looking at, acquisition and the steps leading to onboarding and the steps leading to activation, which is like the first meaningful action that they've done on your app or product or whatever, is where the largest amount of drop-offs happen. And please focus on that. And your companies will company or product will start doing extremely differently if you're just able to fix that. So your product's introduction, the first time usage, your overall design, on how does it look like, excuse me, is all uh, a part of that. All right. But we have to think about retention as well. Uh, so, and this is a very um, in interesting or important one as well. High frequency products win. Like again, look at your product once again and think, how do I make this product high frequency? And of course, there are categories in which you cannot make your product go high frequency. Real estate purchase products are not going to be high frequency products or uh, you know, uh, airlines products will not be high frequency products. But in whichever category you're playing, think about what is the highest category possible in this category. And then how do I get to that point? And what are the actions that are needed? What should be true in my product? And what should be true in my customer's behavior for it to become a habit? 
uh, well, again, real estate uh, <laughs> may not have that habit thing. But if you're running a Swiggy, yes, you will need to make it a habit so that the first time that a user thinks about which product to use, they come to yours and not like the competitors. And the same thing the other guy is also doing. Because nowadays, markets are very competitive. If you are not doing it, somebody else is doing it, they will create a habit, you lose out. So it's very, very important that you think about it from a habit point of view. Uh, another, I think like mostly everybody would know that. Uh, and we talked about two things, right? One is what are the events that should happen in your product? Uh, Facebook 2007 or 8, I, I, I think, um, and when Chamath was running their, their growth uh, uh, charter, one very interesting thesis or insight that they found through data was that if a user has made 10 friends in, 10 friends in 15 days, then their retention and usage goes up. If they have not made 10 friends in the first 10 days, then it goes down and they will never come back. And they just acted on that insight and that took them from 100 million users to a billion users. It was that powerful. So, so again, some of them may be counterintuitive. Look at your data very carefully. Look at those human insights very carefully. Try to marry them, conduct experiments. Look at those behaviors that you can build so that your product becomes a habit. And when the habits get built, your all your usage curves go up, your monetization is happy, your company grows 100x. Work backwards from a future. So this is probably my last uh, slide because I know that there's a very interesting panel also coming up. Um, there's also a book called Work Back, Working Backwards. So I highly recommend. So these are the two book suggestions for today. One is How Brands Grow. Second is called Working Backwards. Working Backwards is an Amazon way of, of building products. So instead of thinking, hey, should I build this feature? Let's iterate, let's figure out and so on. And there are 10 people who are working on that or your, or letting your startup be extremely hand wavy. Instead of that, imagine a date. Imagine what really needs to be true on that date in terms of what will you launch? Your vision has to be clear. And this is not the vision of like a uh, world peace vision. Vision means clearest vision of what a user will see, how the machinery which runs that product will work, what are the risks that you have handled. And six months out or a year out and so on, write that down in a press release format. So that's something that Amazon does very, very well. So this is, for example, a PRFQ template. I'm not going to go through like actually the template, but they actually write a press release. It's very, very important that you write that press release and then make all the trade-offs right there because it's a one pager. And then you're saying, okay, Bangalore, 24th April, 2024. And then after that, a bunch of things are, uh, are written. Then you speak with your team. Can we make all this happen on 24th? No. All right, we'll change the date. And let's actually like work towards the wordings of my press release so that it reflects if this product was launched. One, what product will be launched? What is the scope? And what are the most important decisions that you're taking and trade-offs that you're working on? If this product was launched, what would a customer say? That is right there, the accepted customer belief. Because even if after reading that press release, you are saying, Ye banane se aisa koi bolne wala, then you should not work on that probably. Uh, if you're going to take a big bet, make that bet count and work towards making customers happy. And a lot of experiments should really just be thought experiments and should be junk. So that's another um, you know, masterclass that at least I have seen. Uh, not all ideas are great ideas. Not all ideas need to be experimented. You play it out and you say, okay, by this date, all of these things need to be true. I want to experiment. And I say, will people respond positively? No, then don't do it. If you're reasonably sure. If you think that maybe there will be a segment of customers that can do it and if your startup is dire state or if your startup has like a lot of free bandwidth and so on, then do it. But over a period of time, you'll re realize the rhythm. Cool. So those were a few masterclass elements from uh, from me. Thank you very much. You've been an amazing audience, very attentive. And if there are any questions, one or two, I can take them. Yes. I can, but I don't think others can. So yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Imanshu and uh, I work in a fairly small startup. It's like a 30 people company. So, you know, going through your uh, talk, I realized that you have you've been talking about mental and frameworks and yes. marketers or product people should do. But my question is, how do you think about these frameworks when you are firefighting? Firefighting is like for survival. I mean, it's everything. <laughs> so how do you take out time to think about, okay, no, this is a model versus, okay, no, I have to make the revenue. 
Yeah, I think I think that's a very common question, and mostly all startups will 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 face that that point. And um, I think of that as as like two different aspects, and that duality must be true in all founders and product managers alike. If you are only thinking short term and for survival, by the way, only think survival. If you are if you are if literally those fires are are going to come and so on, that's fine. But even think of them as fire prevention and fire fighting. And you need to go from firefighting to fire prevention. So first step is is fire prevention. Do not think of growth first because you need to have less fires. Because if you are going to build an, a very unstable product on top of that, growth cannot happen. Even if it happens, it is like bad growth. It will go away because you will disappoint your customers a lot, and they will go away. So definitely, you need to think about about firefighting, but very quickly start moving to fire prevention, and very and at that at the stage start thinking about growth and scale. So that's my suggestion. Again. It depends on each company and it, each company's uh, profile and trajectory, but you have to start thinking about scale. And unless somebody in your team, either it's a co-founder or somebody senior or even somebody junior, exclusively thinking about this without constraints of what is happening today, just imagining a brighter future, and then keeping those ideas in, uh, I think you will not be up for like a mega success. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi, my name is Sumit. Uh, one question that you, I mean, one one thing that you mentioned is uh, it's better to focus on uh, acquisition for uh, growth ROI as compared to retention. But is, isn't that? Uh, I didn't I didn't say that. I'm saying marketing dollars. Yeah, marketing dollars. Maybe. Yeah, to, to be precise. But uh, focusing on retention will not. I mean, will definitely reduce the acquisition cost because the retention is increasing and the overall growth of the company will be significant. So why do you say that? And uh, why not focusing on both in balance will be a better option? Yes. So um, so two reasons, right? One. Like I mentioned, the biggest drop off that happens if 100 people come, most people drop off in in your first usage, first month, first X months, whatever you say. So even and again, that's this not a universal uh, universal answer. You can look at your company's data and see what's your onboarding journey to actual three month usage and so on. And most of that is fixable, by the way. That's one. But increasing frequency is a way harder problem. So if your people who are already retained, they already love you, getting them to love you more through marketing dollars is difficult. Second, third, there is also going to be a lot of incidental burn. So for 10 people, so for example, you have like this curve and amongst those only 10% people are not behaving the way you want them to, but you will choose that segment and 90% people who are perfectly happy with your product will, will start eating into that marketing dollars also just to impact that 10. So Again, simple models, but you need to do the math. But that's why it's a contrarian opinion. Uh, acquisition, and most startup founders hate that word. We will get to a user and we'll keep them for life. Well, you can, yes, and great, go for that also. But do not forget acquisition. That's why that, that contrarian point was made. All right, cool, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes, give a big round of applause. Big round of applause for Anuj Rathi, the man himself. Thank you so much, Anuj. Big round of applause, guys. Thank you, Anuj. Thank you. Okay, that was awesome, guys. Get ready for the next and the final panel for the day. And it's consumer tech, how to grow consumer businesses in today's digital world. And you're going to have some big, big speakers coming up very soon. We have Bipul Parikh, the man behind Big Basket. The man who built it and sold it for 8,000 crores. You have, he's IM Bangalore. He's, he's got more than 25 years experience, 30 years experience in industry. He's going to be on stage. You're going to have Amulik Singh Vidral, who's a co-founder of Chai Point. One of the largest chai and tea chains in the country. He has more than 180 stores. He's a Harvard grad and decided he's going to build the biggest chain. Then we have Neha Khan from Clovia, who sold it for 1,000 crores, almost to Reliance. Then you have Varun Kullar, who's actually built his, uh, his office there, uh, IIT Madras, ISB, McKinsey, Boston Scientific, and, and uh, LinkedIn Head of Growth for Asia Pack. And you're going to have Ankur Khetan, who's a Fireside Ventures principal, who's got brands like Boat and Mama Earth in their portfolio, more than 3,000 crores deployed across 33 brands. Guys, you want to hear, this is the power pack panel. We've kept the best for the last, right? Please help me welcome them on the stage, one by one. Vipul Parik, big round of applause. Big Basket, founder of Big Basket. 
Vipul Parikh. Now we have, can we have Neha Kant on the stage, please, from Clovia? Vipul, you want to? Neha Kant on stage, Clovia, please. Give a big round of applause. Amulik Singh Bijral, Chai Point founder. Varun Khulla, LinkedIn head of growth Asia Pack. He's on to his next venture. You want to take uh, this one, Varun? This one here? Yeah, so that they can, they can match the faces to the. And Ankur Khetan himself. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you, Ankur. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, right. Uh, we shall get started with uh, obviously a very power packed uh, co panelists. And uh, what I read commonly through the introduction was uh, there was an idea which stuck them a few years back. And uh, that idea, which could have been seemingly small or large, but with a very clear, sharp focus on building for the consumers, they have not only scaled companies. They scale them successfully. And today, these are forces to reckon with. So on that note, uh, maybe I'd just request my uh, co-panelists to make a quick introduction. And, and with the introduction, talk about that one single insight which made you believe in your entrepreneurial journey to take that step to start this business. And uh, I'll come to you as well in terms of how your journey has panned out. But, uh, you could start with the people. Sorry for that. Uh, technology and me don't go along very well, <laughs> though I'm in a tech business. Uh, my name is Vipul Parekh. i uh, one of the co-founders of Big Basket. Uh, hopefully, most of you heard of Big Basket. We're an online grocery business. Uh, started about, uh, I think, almost about 12 years back now, to, to 2011 and 2023. And uh, Big Basket came about uh, because uh, uh, we had this uh, stupid idea of trying to sell stuff online uh, way back in uh, you know uh, 1999. Right, and we said, you know, uh, this is a great time. In India will Amazon was there in the U.S. and we said, you know, India will eventually start uh, buying stuff online. Except that 1999 was the time when people were still on dial-up lines, right? And nobody had there was no mobile net, there was no mobile internet, so it was way too early. And as part of that, we launched uh, uh, groceries as an online category. And to our great surprise, actually, groceries outs outsold uh, CDs and used to ship CDs those days. So you can imagine how ancient I am. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, uh, that sort of uh, gave us a belief that there is a market for online grocery in India. Uh, so when, uh, predictably, when the entire business went bust, we said we'll shift to actually doing a physical grocery or, uh, and stop doing online because the online doesn't work in India. So we built an offline grocery business, uh, uh, built that, sold that. And then we said, you know, uh, some years later in 2006, we said, you know, it's important that we go back to grocery again. Maybe now's the time. Uh, to go back to online grocery. So we started uh, Big Basket in 2011, except that it was still very early. And I remember going and meeting investors and they're saying, are you joking? Do you think people are going to buy groceries online in India? Uh, much to their surprise, they did. And that's how Big Basket got started. I think we were fortunate. Uh, uh, Big Basket came through a lot of trial and error, as you, get, as you just heard. And, and, and a lot of entrepreneurship, actually one of the biggest insights I've had is that there's no sure shot way to success. I mean, nobody, the best VCs, the best entrepreneurs uh, can never be sure that the idea is going to work. Uh, it's a matter of iteration. It's a matter of staying steadfast and a matter of discovering what, how, you, how you can shape your product to the market. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, fundamental insight which uh, took me to take a plunge in uh, selling chai was the size of the market and the extreme neglect for the second most consumed beverage and absence of any single brand which was trying to do justice to it. So I was looking fundamentally for a very large TAM. I come from a tech background, cut my teeth mostly in Microsoft, started as a developer and going on. 
So I got into it with the idea of building a product brand. Journey was through retail, but we were quite clear right in the beginning that arms reach convenience around the product is the only way to capture this huge TAM. Because, you know, chai, I mean, imagine if there was great chai, somebody going around without disturbing everybody, everybody would extend the arm or at least 70, 80, if not 90% of the people here. So we are at a stage now, as people very rightly mentioned, it's very difficult to articulate, you know, insights. Life of an entrepreneur is so iterative in terms of execution and learning. So where do we stand right now is the key. The key is that uh, omni-channel reality, brewing bots, because this whole thing of chai being an art form is uh, the reason why uh, 35 crore cups per day market for our TAM has not been able to build a credible brand. It's been sort of uh, pseudo-romance may neglected market right here, is how I think of it. The reality is that in order to cater to this market, you need to invest in brewing bots, which give you authentic chai, which itself is a manufacturing and a software journey, so highly iterative. And the brand building route to that has to be a channel which is relatively higher in customer experience, which in our case is the store. But uh, we think of the store as a brand vector. The scale vector is brewing bots of various kinds. We are in fifth version now of our brewing bots, ultimately solving authenticity and quality cup of chai with an arm's reach for the consumer. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Neha. I think uh, Big Basket or Chai Point or even LinkedIn does not need introduction, but to a room full of men, mostly men, my business would definitely need an introduction. I'm founder of Clovia. It's a women's lingerie brand. Um, we launched about eight years back. And uh, I grew up in a very small town, uh, Haridwar in uh, Uttarakhand. And uh, I don't know, throughout my student life, I never went to the store to buy my underwear. It was always my mother and retailer figuring out what I should be wearing. The retailer had never seen me. And this is how I grew up. I went to Delhi for further studies after school and uh, the trend continued. And even when I started to work and by now I was shopping with my own money at high streets of Delhi, but the problem hadn't solved itself. And uh, and I grew up my adolescent or my uh, teenage years or uh, youth was I grew up a little uncomfortable in my skin and uh, and as an active sports person I the problem was probably compounded for me even more and I always wondered uh, this thought was always with me um, but I did not know what is exactly the problem and I just happened to travel uh, internationally a little bit for work and walked into a store there and got fitted for underwear and I realized this is this is what had been missing and this is what we don't get in India. Uh, this was back in 2010 uh, and I came back and I started my research in my own time figuring out why there have been brands, of course, underwear is sold in India. There are brands and there were some international brands as well in India. And why are we still in that same uh, one size fit all kind of uh, environment or uh, and then I realized supply chain, the way it is structured. Um, the way the retail counters are built for this category, and that is the problem. You cannot really um, stock uh, so many sizes, etc. And you cannot manufacture also a lot of brands are manufacturing on their own and then distributing. So you cannot have so many problems solving them uh, in one go. And uh, therefore, uh, the problem that they solved was that let's condition customer to just keep wearing one. And uh, that was the insight for us and that was the problem that uh, I and my uh, team members also felt uh, that needs solving. That's how we got started. Uh, the one thing that I think kept us uh, steady in our entrepreneurship journey was, um, was I think, uh, you know, my a large part of my audience, my consumer base is Gen Z and there's this word they use called Delulu, uh, which means delusional. <laughs> so I think one thing which helped us was that we were never Delulu. We of course fell uh, in love with the, our idea and we we kept pursuing it, but we were always very realistic about the about the realities of life, the how, uh, you know, uh, about cash flows in the business. Survival, of course, um, stayed 
uh, a priority ahead of all the grand ideas of brand building and consumer experience. Uh, it's a very contrary, probably a very harsh <laughs> thought that I'm putting out there, but that's, I think uh, that's what worked for us eventually. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, the business I represent is slightly different from all these businesses, but uh, contrary to popular belief, like LinkedIn actually, uh, you know, operates internally just like a startup, honestly. Uh, you know, there is this speed uh, and energy to uh, make things happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, at least some insights that uh, we've learned over the last, you know, almost like five to eight years, especially is that uh, while a lot of people in India specifically, and I'll talk about the Indian context, although I look at APAC, uh, is that Indians, while they have LinkedIn as you know on their as an app on their phones, they may not necessarily use it on a weekly basis. Okay, so this was or and continues to be a challenge that we faced, uh, you know, five six years back, and so uh, we call it VOWs, weekly active users, and all of you may be aware of this term. So we basically narrowed it down to two things. One, we said, hey, like fundamentally people think of LinkedIn as a place you come for jobs, okay? Is there other, so firstly, can we strengthen that? You know, can we like really, really like make a mark in terms of, you know, what are we standing for in terms of jobs? And so over a period of time, we basically incre increased the liquidity of jobs on the platform and made sure that we are known for, and we were talking about this earlier, uh, you know, if you want anybody from the middle to senior management, uh, you know, you come to LinkedIn, and otherwise there are a lot of other platforms like Nokri, et cetera, that you go for. So we made sure that we were consciously focusing on the B2B segment, which basically was hiring for these kind of people. And I think we kind of cracked that like, you know, a few years back. Uh, the second thing that we started uh, doing, and of course it also got, uh, you know, accelerated through COVID and so on and so forth was, basically LinkedIn started to become and is now like a digital resume. Okay, so everybody here, ideally if you're meeting somebody, you will actually like see them on LinkedIn before you're actually meeting them, right? And you will check them out, what they've been doing and so on and so forth. And this is so powerful now in the digital economy that it's a use case which is becoming more and more prevalent. And of course it leads to also, you know, connecting and then meeting offline and then you know having the conversation online and so on so this concept of digital resume is something that we've kind of you know enabled and done more and more of which which has really helped us accelerate uh, and so now like india is more than 110 million users we are second only uh, to the us which is 194 per, uh, million users however uh, that uh, you know that is uh, a country which is 97% penetrated and we are only 20% penetrated so huge uh, you know scope for improvement and so on and yeah great thanks so i think uh, there were two common themes i picked up one obviously building for a large consumer and tech solving for uh, obviously choices as you can give it big basket uh, unified experience as you're talking about in a chai points case supply chain as you're talking about in plovia and possibly engagement that I read from your uh, comment. Uh, I mean, maybe just double clicking on each of these, uh, right? Moving from idea to very early in your business. Uh, if you could uh, help specifically understand uh, in your case, Vipul, for what did tech solve for? Because the business you are operating in, uh, the kind of bread I could be consuming at home, vis-a-vis -vis the bread loaf that's bought in my immediate neighborhood could be so different. It could be different uh, perpetually. It could be different on a particular day. Uh, there could be so many choices I could, when I am looking for fruits, vegetables, with that expansive play in mind, how did you really take in tech into your business model? So if you look at uh, grocery as a category fundamentally, the challenge is that the number of SKUs that you carry is very large. Uh, if you look at your typical supermarket store that you go to uh, next door, and just to tell you the size of the challenge, they carry about four to 5,000 SKUs. If you take, uh, uh, you know, a Kirana store carries about 700, 800 SKUs. So that's actually magnified 3x, 4x times at, uh, at the case of, uh, you know, uh, a supermarket. If you take Big Basket, for example, we carry about 50,000 SKUs. Now the challenge is if you, if you have 50,000 SKUs, how do you manage inventory? How do you manage perishability? Because dealing with food and food is perishable. And that we can't have, I can't be sending expired stuff. I can't be, hopefully we're not sending them. Uh, we can't be selling that. Uh, we need to make sure that our uh, stock is fresh. We need to make sure that, you know, at any point in time, inventory is actually managed well. 
and more importantly, at any point in time, I'm able to service a customer's order, even more than that, right? So if a customer picks any of these items, how, how can I be sure that I will actually fill this every time? So the three big challenges are uh, all related to, one is forecasting. How do I forecast well? So if you take something like fruits and vegetables, for example, which is highly perishable, and in India, you don't have a very high, highly developed cold chain, and, and for a lot of leafy, the, the, the shelf life is only 24, 36 hours, or, or 48 hours at best. So if you need to manage the supply chain from farm to customer, you need to make sure that it gets delivered fresh. It doesn't, because if it dies, you, you've lost that stock and you've lost money. So therefore, the challenge gets magnified. So one of the biggest challenges is forecasting. So therefore, you need to build algorithms to forecast. And how do you therefore forecast for every individual SKU, for every supplier, for every uh, uh, you know item? So we married both this inventory management and forecasting, and said, you know, uh, let's let's figure out how do we start looking at early trends when we have new products or when we have existing products. Existing products, we know we have 10 years of data. You know how customers are going to buy. You know when are they going to buy? Which season dal will happen? Which season coffee will move up? Which season tea will drop? And and therefore we have significant amount of data. So we are able to more, you know, form a, use that data to really start predicting. So one of the biggest, uh, you know, uses of tech is in terms of prediction of or forecasting of what customers are going to buy. And you have to be very, very accurate. And the challenge of accuracy, and I'll give you this, uh, you know, today we carry, for example, 13 days of inventory, right? If you take any large retail chain, we'll carry roughly 2x of that. At a SKU count, which is uh, one third of ours, or one fourth of ours. So therefore, this is, and this is best in class worldwide. You won't find anybody doing this better than any, anywhere else. And this happens, and this has happened over a period of time. It's not that we, one fine day we dreamt up an algorithm and said, okay, fine, this is it. I am open AI and I've got this product and this works brilliantly out of the box. So it took us a lot of effort to really figure out how to actually uh, craft this and get this right. The second challenge was, you know, how do you manage inventory? Because we have, we have this so much of inventory sitting. One of the biggest challenges for retailers worldwide, it doesn't matter which category they operate in, is inventory. Because dead inventory, non-fresh inventory is, is just your biggest loss. And in the case of uh, grocery, it gets magnified because you can't sell. Uh, even if you sell it at a discount, nobody wants to buy. Because people know it's old, right? It's old milk, you don't want to pick it up. Old butter, you don't want to pick it up. Anything old, customers are very, very wary. So therefore, you need to start tracking, uh, making sure that your fresh inventory, you need to make sure that your cycles are very high. And you need to sync it with your suppliers who are not digitally aware or may not be digitally native like you are. So therefore, how do you manage, uh, you know, uh, on one side, you have a supplier who's probably manufacturing, and whenever you place an order, it supplies 50% or 60% of your order. So one of the biggest brands in the, in the in the country, and we had the biggest problems with them, because they accounted for about 5 to 8% of the sales. So if you guys can guess who that brand is, I won't say it. And, uh, and, and they would, they would at any point in time, you would place an order, they would deliver 60% of it. Now, if they delivered consistently 60%, that was great. But one day they would deliver 50%, one day they would deliver 80%. And I, I, it would vary across SKU. So you didn't know which one was now going to, not going to turn up. So you had to actually, so you deal with this variance on one side. On the other side, we deliver 99.7, 99.8% fill rate to customers. Right? So customer gets every order, that they're, every item that they order. In fact, when we, and we used to have this till I think about a year or two years back when we removed it, we used to have a fill rate guarantee to customers and say, if we don't deliver something to you, we'll give you 50% of the item value back. So that was actually putting a lot of confidence in our processes and also a lot of pressure on ourselves saying that you have to say, because if you don't sell, a, if you don't have something customer orders and you don't have it and you're dead, because essentially you're paying money to the customer for doing nothing. So therefore that pressure was there on us. On the other side, you have this fill rate, which is extremely variable from a supplier side. So the, marrying these two becomes very important. So the, the, the goal was really to marry perishability, inventory, uh, you know, uh, forecast, and this thing. So we said, let's build a single system which is uses customer data. So it's got about 10, 20 variables. So it has things like season, it has things like supplier, it has things like SKU. Because you know, if you take Colgate toothpaste, now there are five different uh, right variants, and within the five variants, you have five different sizes. So you know, 25. Now you need to predict at the variant size because it doesn't matter to the customer if I don't have a 50 gram and if you want buy 50 gram. And if I tell, try to tell him to take 100 grams, he's not going to take it. Right? At the same time, I, if he wants red and I have blue, he's not going to take it. So you need to get it right at the variant level. 
so we said we we have to focus by variant by season by uh, you know beginning of the month by end of the month because customers tend to buy higher in grocery towards the beginning of the month than they do later so most of the sales happen uh, in the first 10 days of the month that's a uh, old habit people get salaries so they go and buy grocery and it continues even today surprisingly so therefore you have to take care of even that nuance so therefore you need to take care of all this multiple and the only way you can manage something like this is is by uh, using technology there is absolutely no other way to do it. so in our case our buyers and merchandisers cannot place a manual order so only the system will not allow them to place a manual order the system computes the order at any point in time looking at the variables and the only way the, the time they can override it is if there's a promotion or there uh, it's a new uh, you know variant that's been introduced but they are supposed to forecast for the first time but after that the, the technology takes over and that starts predicting and that starts deciding what should be ordered the buyer does not order because if it cross 30000 sqs 50000 sqs if we start ordering manually first it's not possible second you will get it completely wrong and then you will have inventory which is you are dead and buried before the business takes off so i think technology is a very key component in terms of managing uh, you know inventory managing forecast managing the supply chain great thanks uh um, moving on to amul pri i think uh, so you know the my question to you is more around uh you're in a category far far complicated around on the something which is which has consumption moment to talk to someone socially to be associated with nostalgia to be associated as a habit of drinking tea morning evening uh, catching up with someone a friend over conversation part of meetings and each one has a very different taste to it right because they've been consuming tea at home they have a a very peculiar way of of uh, of uh, recipe to to tea how do you begin tech because your consumers who are walking into a cafe or your chai point are very different from a taste standpoint you may have absolutely no data on what their taste would be and you know tech could be an endless play where you could continue to have your bots create recipes of recipes continue to engineer it time and again how do you get to that perfection of saying today anybody walking into a chai point will walk out as a happy consumer so i just want to understand the experience layer to tech yeah so uh, you know just from a location standpoint actually cafe is a much simpler problem to solve uh, the scale of the problem hits you once you are in 5 6000 locations with your group box right corporate offices hospitals now we are getting into educational institution warehouses manufacturing all there are five brewing bots for different use cases so that's one aspect that the scale cafe is also a scale problem but installations across sites is a bigger one the other part is that uh, uh chai as a product is actually a very complicated one. coffee is fundamentally a ratio play of espresso shot water and milk right if you just look at the hot cup it's a ratio play right so the number of ingredients max are three in the world of chai you have spices which range from you know maybe 10 to 15 to 20 and people are getting increasingly connected to it then of course like coffee in chai i mean the milk fat levels right? so the permutation combination at the net number of recipes that you need to remember are much larger second coffee is a per cup phenomena in india chai is a we like to say it a liter phenomenon so volume uh, chai holds for delivery cappuccino yes delivery is there as a convenience but fundamentally it's not a product uh, integrity holding or enhancing channel right but chai has been delivered in india since ages steel flask and you know we we pioneered the innovation of heat retaining use and throw flask so the volumes of chai production literally go into tens and some stores hundreds of liters and not hundreds of cups so when you have different sizes multiple products the recipes that result are manifold so for the same product masala chai let's say a 100 ml recipe is different from a 200 ml to a 500 ml to a liter brewing time volume so what we realized very early on is that the training of our chai masters or whatever chai baristas was getting more and more complicated 
So we built a consistent business. I think our promise fundamentally has been consistent. I would like to believe that we've done a decent job. We can do a lot better, but our product integrity and quality across states, wherever we are, is fairly consistent. There's a lot of room to improve, but fairly consistent. So it was getting impossible for a guy to be trained. I mean, I and we built the curriculum. See, the fundamental problem that we solved was right? So but fundamentally, people hanker for predictability and consistency. I need that kind of chai. No recall factor in even I, because nobody even built recipes. While as in the world of coffee, you had infographics. This is a flat white. This is a macchiato, right? I mean, the infographic-based promotion of the product so that customer feels, oh, I like that ratio. It's not a milk cooper. It's not a macchiato. Get away with it. So, of chai, we kisi ne dhyan nahi So, once we started building recipes, and the reality became clear that the recipes are multifold, it was next to impossible for a human person, human, to really cater to it. So, the brewing bot fundamentally what it does is it has a cloud memory. So, there is an Android tab, and it's a hardware and software play. All the ingredients are loaded. It's a radar driven, I'm talking about the brewing bot, which is there at the store. So there are five that different, it gets different sort of uh, engineering, whatever intervention. But fundamentally, based on the recipe, the guy just has to say, I need one liter of masala chai. And that's it. Ingredients will fall. There's an interruption pad. There is a radar because line of sight, have you noticed you go into a chai shop, there is a guy who's dedicated for chai. Why? Because, you know, 50 years old. So he's controlling the flame. They're literally a dedicated guy. And he's the most expensive resource in all the darshanis and restaurants. Because he's just fixated on this. He can't multitask. So he built a radar. What the radar does is that the boils are all controlled. The you know heating intensity gets controlled. And fundamentally then you are able to dish out literally hundreds of recipes without the person memorizing. So at one level, this is the fundamental problem. Then integrating it with use cases. So we very recently launched what we believe is the world's first per cup brewing system. So in coffee, you press button, you have beans, espresso, cup up. And this is our fifth gen. Now we've launched something which, and we've deployed close to about three, 400, and we're just frankly going ahead with it. You press the button, tea leaves, milk, water, brewed for you in 2025 seconds, the authentic way, right? And of course, this is an engineering problem, right? So um, coffee machines have been built for the last 90 years, right? I mean, 90 years, 1940s, Vienna, Germany ke cafes, they would have coffee machines and boom, boom, boom. Now, you know, at that level. Chai, we would like to say we started it six years ago, literally, you know, nobody paid attention to it. So integrating this with the point of sale system, because there is no chai POS. You know, I mean, you need to have a point of sale system, which is taking into account the chai reality, right? So we've integrated the bot with the POS so that when you decide that, oh, at airport, I have to make 100 liters because the flights hit at this, this time, the person enters it, it goes into the POS and the POS logs it. Okay, at this time, this partner name, employee solid of the chai right. and then delivery systems on top of the boss right i mean with use and throw chai flask we believe that we created an annual category of at least 500 crores if not more i mean if i just take the top 20 30 brands brands or companies which are selling chai online delivery my hunch is around 400 500 crores of sales and that dynamic also getting captured into the boss. So supply chain, you know, we are a milk business, right? Which is a perishable sort of, it was six, seven lakh liters of milk a month growing at a nice clip. How do you order it? Demand forecasting of milk. Now the distribution of milk is great, but demand has to be driven from the store, right? I mean, distribution of milk in India is fantastic because the large co-ops, they have distributors in every local corner. And there's no way better. 
you know, I can attempt. So the tech part starts coming in. And then we embrace filter coffee. We realize filter coffee is the same problem with the animator. So, and we are arguably the largest seller of filter coffee. So integrated it into the system, made sure the system is all Android, which gives us the capability to integrate the brewing bots, as we call them, with multiple other software solutions. So that's our journey. Nice. Thanks. So quite fascinating, I must say. Uh, moving on to you, Neha, I think, uh, you know, as you said in your introduction, uh, there was an insight, which was your personal experience of not being able to purchase laundry with the right comfort, right? Now, in your growth journey early, and, and you went a very multi-channel approach, right, where there was digital, and digital was catching pace at that time very fast, continues to do so even more. Uh, you had your own outlets, you had the general trade the retailer who possibly didn't understand the perfect blend of functionality and design in your category. And ultimately, the consumer is so diverse, and the choices are so diverse, be it sizes, be it in terms of the design, and they wanted that perfect fit, right? So how, how did you really think of scaling the business with a very multi-channel approach, blending tech as well, keeping in mind the product design? So just help us walk through the early journey of growth. Um, so I think uh, if you say early in our case, it did, it did really early because um, Clovia, in fact, predates Instagram, WhatsApp, uh, uh, Probably, yeah, definitely Uber. So, uh, you know, when we started, 100% uh, of the business was on desktop, and then mobile, and now apps, and so on. Um, but in a business like ours, like Ripple G said, there are only two levers, inventory and brand, or brand slash user experience. Uh, and both require money. And, uh, uh, you know, you lose the balance, and then you lose your way. Um, so I won't get too much into inventory because he already spoke a lot about it. Uh, just a quick review that in our, we address nine body types, 50 plus sizes, six life stages of a woman, uh, each requiring different kind of a product. Uh, and then there are add-ons like sports and uh, different other things. Um, so the excuse at any point of time we are managing uh, is some 200,000 and more. Um, average product has basic minimum size a product would have is nine and going up to uh, 32 sizes in one product. So the problem was really complex. And if we wanted to really address every girl with a product best fitted for her, um, this was the only way that you, there is no manual ordering of the product. There's no manual designing or thinking of the product. It all had to be uh, learned and then applied. So we, from day one, we built a very uh, robust feedback gathering engine uh, where we kept putting obviously initially we did put some seed designs out there and we kept learning on what fabric is working what is not working what fit is working uh, making short batches and then uh, scaling them and creating 45 days worth of production plan and mapping it all throughout uh, such that we never go out of way and then when we moved out of digital space which was our which had become a comfort space and moved to offline it was a different game altogether because now we had the same problem of just uh, you know a small hundred square feet kiosk from where we can sell and therefore 200,000 SKUs won't come in uh, to save us and we only can at best keep 2,000 there. Um, and so then again the system uh, had to be built, the planning, uh, so there is no manual planning, the system has to plan and then give out uh, optimum shelf stocking for that, uh, for that store such that our Clovia store, let's say, in a street in Delhi, and a mom and pop store just two kilometers away, will have a slightly different product and price mix. Anywhere between 10% to 50% of the product mix will be different between two stores, uh, depending on the stores where they are. And this this kept working in, so that with so much complexity, also we were uh, industry best in our uh, inventory holding till date. For our core categories, we still hold less than 30 days of inventory. Um, and it's always fresh. It's always coming in. And uh, so that was one part of the job, I think, that we did well. The second part was the user experience, uh, which was really interesting with the way the users have evolved and their adoption of technology has evolved. Like I said, we started from desktop. And there, the one big problem was that uh, people didn't want to browse because you see models in underwear, they didn't want to browse. And most everybody was shopping at that time 
during lunch hours in uh, in offices so we created something called private mode and you toggle that button and then all the the screen will go blank and only where your cursor is the picture will come alive and uh, so that's how we got started then we built something called a clovia fit test where a girl could go take a small five question quiz but which is very uh, visually with which she can depict what is her body type and nobody had done that kind of research ever i don't uh, definitely not in india uh, but not much around the world also and today we have 1 million very intimate uh, body profiles of indian women which help us create those fits for those nine arrive at those nine body types and arrive at the right sizing so is that even that such a second skin product such a fit oriented product our return on exchange rate is less than 10% uh, where and i'm speaking online i think for non fit products also it's more than 10% but we have been able to uh, reach that level of um, fit accuracy of course tech also played a lot of role in terms of product uh, production quality but getting back on user experience this this fit test also taught women how to pick their size it eventually after taking the fit test it told them what is your body profile and this is the kind of fit or this is the kind of style of uh, underwear that you should be wearing because a whole host of generation like me had grown up never looking at the products always believing what our mothers gave us and then you know just uh, we we had no idea what will fit us so that that i think earned us that trust and uh, of our customer and also build that intimate profile that we could uh, intimate relationship with them a trustful relationship that we could then extend on to other categories also and then latest something which i which i really like what we just did uh, it's not even a year old is that we were always told customers always wrote you always show zero size models who are these girls from russia ukraine blah blah you uh, we don't identify with them so we kept you know we kept trying different things and at one point we even scored the images because if you're selling online somehow this is the first visual hook where uh, you know a girl is going to decide whether this product i like or not there's nothing there's no uh, experience hand touch feel experience so uh, we always struggled with what kind of picture to show how to show real women indian women want models so it's not like you can't show too much reality and now thankfully we have ai generated images and we can create these uh, really very close to the body type that we want to address uh, images show product well uh, the way it will fit and put that out there and it has really started to um uh, to work very well with the customer the the shopping the conversion has improved the returns has even dipped better and the customer feedback is um is really uh, showing us that we are on the right path because the because this is like very unique it's quite contrary where people want real women out there but what is really working is where you create these artificially generated images and uh, but that's the thing about user experience that uh, sometimes it's very counter intuitive and you just learn it by listening to them thanks so varun uh, you know i'm going to ask you a question uh, with a very clear mindset that linkedin has operated as a startup right and and your competition ranges from the likes of facebook to whatsapp to instagram to tinder and shadi.com you're such a diverse sort of uh, blue collar worker white collar workers coming in uh, on linkedin of course uh, one very interesting thing that's happened is if i just reflect back in the last one year uh, there have possibly been days when more time on linkedin than instagram for sure right i think uh, what i wanted to understand is in your business there's a very fine balance of engagement and creating nudges for engagement and pushing the bar on monetization right so as as linkedin was growing through in the journey and and with an indian focused market as well how did you really think of this engagement versus monetization for the growth story over a long term uh so that's a good question so uh for that you to you have to understand how linkedin makes money uh, so think of linkedin as uh, three marketplaces okay the first is the talent marketplace where people come to get jobs and companies are posting jobs so there is a marketplace of jobs and basically talent the second is uh, as we call it the sales and marketing uh, marketplace where you are basically coming in for leads so you are selling something on linkedin it's like you are you are running an ad fundamentally you're getting leads out of it okay uh that's marketing and then you're also looking for specific sales leaders right so you're looking for people who are decision makers right and so that's the sales and marketing uh marketplace 
and the third is the knowledge marketplace so it's it's why you come to linkedin on a daily basis to learn something it includes linkedin learning but it also includes learning from each other so hey like what is my peer or what is the person who i look up to in linkedin uh, posting so that i can learn from them right so these are the three marketplaces now the first two are b2b products okay so large companies will post jobs they pay us for that i mean for the job slots uh, and then the second is sales and marketing which is basically a typical google facebook model you know you basically pay and run ads on linkedin right but the third marketplace actually is powering this entire b2b space okay the third is where you basically get the users on a daily basis and that, that is the uh, you know marketplace which actually drives the monetization for the first two businesses now uh, and we say like uh, the knowledge marketplace is is the ocean which raises all boats right so that's the way and that's the way a tech businesses also work in general now the interesting part is how this third knowledge marketplace business is to be accelerated and i think that's the key to the success of linkedin in the last few years and there is there are two parts to that a supply and demand part to uh, the knowledge marketplace the first is uh, you know when we say supply we say what is the supply that you want on linkedin so it is the feed so when you open linkedin what do you see on linkedin at like what do you see in the feed there are like 50000 options of what you can see in the first slot right so what is it that we can show you that will grab your attention and then what is it that the first three panes pretty much will uh, will will have because after that nobody will scroll right so the the conceptual difference that linkedin has created is that we have gone away from a network based feed to an interest based feed what that means is earlier what the feed used to show is what you know if i'm connected uh, to the panel members here what they are posting or what they are liking that will be what will be shown on my feed but now it is about what you have been interacting with on the feed so if you're talking about a certain gen ai article if you liked or shared or commented on something then the feed will pick up that hey this person actually is interested in this topic may not be in that person per se so that's how there has been a fundamental shift in the way the feed is designed now okay the second thing which is uh, interesting which is happening is that we've now incorporated ai in a very very big way so uh, you will start to see the linkedin coach uh, product uh, uh, on 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 the platform uh, it's basically like a copilot of sorts uh what it will try to do is if there is a and i'll give you a very simple example if there is a post and there is lots of text the co the coach which is a star like button on the side will say would you like to would you like me to summarize what the person is trying to say here because sometimes there will be lot of text you know and a lot of people will be writing writing essays also which is highly not recommended by the way uh, uh so you know there is a way to summarize that or if you are applying for a job okay it will say hey seems like you're applying for a job if you're interested in this kind of job would you like me to tell you what skills are needed for you to improve your chances to get that job and then it will recommend courses which you need to take to improve and to start the upskilling journey so these are ways in which this coach or this uh, engagement model is improved or is being improved on linkedin so that it becomes a little bit more intuitive we understand what you're really trying to do what is your real use case and we take you along that journey so i think i think there is just some couple of examples that we are we've been doing and i think the third very critical thing is on um, trust so as with uh, large consumer businesses which grow at the speed at which some of these businesses are growing you also need to make sure that people feel comfortable and Uh, trust the platform and so what for that what we did is we launched actually aadhaar based authentication on linkedin where you can fundamentally say that yes i am this person who you know i am claiming to be the fundamental belief there is that at some point we will start to authenticate every claim that you are making on the platform and that is important because there are 1.5 million fake accounts which get created on a weekly basis globally which is a uh, which is a lot right and india is the second biggest in terms of member usage so you can actually say say that on linkedin people just say whatever they want to say and claim whoever they want to be which is incorrect so we've actually gone down this path to say hey how can we like really really come down on trust uh, which is basically education work experience 
identity like those three layers will be like slowly and slowly will get all uh, more and more identity verification on that so so i guess like it's a little bit about growth how it powers the businesses and then how do you get trust to make sure it all sticks together great thank uh, one of you obviously given a lot of food for thought i'm sure we have a lot of budding entrepreneurs in the audience uh, and and how a seemingly very easy problem to solve for requires years of walking the hard yard to really think through from a consumer backwards lens and build towards scale i think that's that's what i'm gathering as a common thread uh, maybe uh, you know we'll just open up for a couple of questions given given uh, running short on time but uh, any questions uh, from the audience Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot of distraction and choices for the modern consumer, Gen Z or Gen Alpha. How do you think about customer loyalty to grow the business? Talking Who is this uh, question directed to, or is it general? Uh, general. I want to more know more about the thought process uh, rather than the specific. <laughs> Find a textbook on this. this is a very broad question, so I think we'll narrow it down. But maybe let me take a shot at it at one facet of it. Right? Uh, how do you build customer loyalty? Why will a customer keep coming back to you? That's the fundamental question. Right? Customer keeps coming back to you if your product is consistent. Amulik spoke about this at great length, right? This entire journey is about really making sure that you get the same cup of tea every time. Because if you get the same cup of tea every time, and you're not going to go to somebody else because you got used to that. It's the same, uh, you know, uh, you know, which is which holds true for every consumer business. So one, you need to be consistent with the product. But having said that, your product has to be good. The product cannot uh, remain stagnant. The product cannot be inferior, because nobody is going to be committed to an inferior product. So your product. So, but the thing to remember is, products do not stay the same. Products evolve over a period of time. Customer tastes change. Uh, in chai, they may not. I think that's one area. The changes. Huh? Okay, interesting. I didn't know that. In, in grocery, it does. People have started buying very different products. They buy organic now. They buy, you know, uh, premium products. They buy imported products. They buy a lot more uh, gourmet. So that that's changing. So you need to actually make sure that your product. Therefore, and now you have 10-minute uh, delivery service. So in in the term, the speed of delivery has changed. So your product first has to be alive. Product has to keep evolving for you to have uh, customer loyalty. Second, you need to make sure that you are consistent to that. What you promise is what you deliver. If you do these two things, these will engender loyalty over a period of time. Hi, uh, hi. Uh, so, question maybe for all Vipul, uh, Amrik, uh, all of you guys. Uh, feel free to answer. Who? <laughs> uh, the question is: When did you actually start trusting your data models over your intuition or over your biases? Actually, बस आपको आना स्टेज पे आप आ जाओ so uh, so uh, I think we started uh, so the moment online became an important part and the moment the scale of bots increased the data just increased it was impossible not to rely on data but it's a very good question because uh, the key is not few people taking decisions on data but how do you have a large section of the company taking decisions on data and and to heart that is still a journey i think our uh, was a unique case because uh, uh, for us it's not just the data that will work but also because there is design there is a Uh, a soft rag built in, uh, which also needs to be uh, considered. So I think the big challenge we had on our data model was not so much as trust it, but also to make sure that the designers are looking at it because somehow there is a concept called number blindness. I think there, so it became for us that also was very important use of tech that the way our they could see the website or the products displayed, they they always saw. 
one number and some color coding was done for them to know this is working this is the feedback which is coming and uh, yes they did not believe the data because they really believed in the design and when they saw that there is something not happening right with them we gave them a whole host of the feedback that you know that is coming on the customer care center etc they could click and open and read it for themselves to know but largely um, i think data models also need verification every a uh, few cycles which we continue to do there are uh, reports that need to be put in place where you can keep verifying because products evolve customers involve behaviors evolve hello yeah hi my question is to vipul sir yeah so sir i run a lifestyle product rental startup sherpal.in so in when is the major challenge which we face usually so what i wanted to understand was you were talking about when it comes to volume we need to there is a demand forecast and then supply automation procurement so what was the uh, priority for you in your business you first worked on the demand forecast part or for automation or the supply procurement automation and what was the reason behind that i i think it's a bit of an iterative process right you start with one and focus on the other so when you're small when you're first buying no supplier is going to give you your terms right he's not going to say you can buy one piece if you want i'll deliver you five times a week none of that happens so eventually what therefore what happens initially is that your inventory is always mismatched to your demand so therefore over period of time as your demand grows you start getting better at demand that's when you can start controlling so if i were to think who which leads which i think the demand forecasting is to lead before your inventory can fall into place uh, hi uh, question more relevant for vipul amul and neha going back to your you know early days you know um, at one point of time you realize that hey there is a product market fit and uh, we need to double down on heavy investment in technology you talk of us about uh, that time okay <laughs> no i think uh, the the question is more actually uh, less to do with technology i more to realize is your product working and a typical sign of uh, of that is when you don't need to advertise when your demand keeps uh, you know uh, uh, grows faster than you can actually say, service it right or you find a lot uh, so there are two three indicators one is obviously your demand grows which is very simple it is seeing a large demand and there's an unmet need so that that's a clear indicator the second is if your customers are very uh, you know uh, loyal you find very high retention very high you know usage and customers keep coming back to you that's also a sign of product market fit in which case you need to figure out which are the product segments that are working so these are typically you know are leading indicators of uh, uh, and, and the third is obviously a consumer feedback if you're not finding people abusing you or, or you know sending you hate mail you have a good product going and i think that's that's really a good place to be great i think uh, we're done with questions thank you so much the panel for coming uh, give them a big round of applause guys what a fantastic panel illustrious panel thank you most of the panelists actually flew in from different cities just for this guys give him one more round of applause for this thank you thank you neha for coming thank you amulik thank you vipul varun and of course ankur great we're going to have in 10 in 10 to 15 minutes we're going to have dinner and drinks on the house so guys uh, is a big gala dinner downstairs so go on after that but before that i would like to give something for the panelists before they leave